Does it look like we have a quorum? Foley? Here. Licardo? Jones? Cohen? Here. And Mahan? Here. Hey, welcome everybody. I think that counts as a quorum, is that right? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, welcome to, I'm pleased to call to order the um, August, uh, actually September, wow, we're in the September meeting now of the Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee. We're excited about our agenda today. We have a few really substantive items. Uh, Rob, we are uh, under orders of the day here. I believe there's a request to reorder the agenda items to stick with item one and then flip uh, two and three. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And do we, should we, do we need to vote on that? Don't know, but I guess it never hurts to vote. Move approval. <laughs> Thank you, okay. council member. Can I get a second? It has to be me, second. All right, why don't we do a quick roll call vote just to be safe. Foley? Aye. Jones? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. And, uh, and thank you to Council Member Cohen for making this work uh, despite a travel schedule. So appreciate you being here. Okay, why don't we jump in, Rob? Do you want to give us a quick overview of what we're covering today and introduce our first item? Yes, sir. Uh, so good afternoon, Chairperson Mahan, uh, Mayor Licardo, committee members and members of the public, Rob Lloyd, Chief Information Officer for the City of San Jose. Today, staff will present three significant items to the committee with direct connections to the city roadmap. Uh, under item D1, uh, we will focus on the city's use of data to improve the lives of residents by using that data to solve critical community challenges and by reviewing resources, priorities, and program design. Matt Lesh, our Assistant Director of Public Works, will introduce a team spanning multiple departments um, for this update. Second, we will follow with D3, a dive into San Jose 311 and San Jose's digital services drive. As identified in the IT strategic plan, digital services is a key strategic pillar for the city's efforts to improve access, resident experiences, and efficiencies. Jerry Dreesen, our assistant CIO, um, Herman Sedano, our products project manager for 311, Kia O'Hara, our San Jose 311 contact center manager, and Matt Opsel, senior executive analyst, and our uh, web guru will provide that report. And then finally, under D3, we will present an update on the city's implementation of the digital project privacy policy that went into effect in July, along with some details about that implementation and future steps as we build the privacy program. With that, I believe um, Matt will kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to pull up the presentation. Let me know when we're all there, and we'll do. We can see it, Matt. Yeah, but the presentation mode is what we want. There you go. There we go. It's like we've done this before. Good afternoon, everyone. Matt Lesh, Assistant Director of Public Works, as Rob indicated. And also, we are here with several of our other great colleagues from multiple departments. Um, we'll kick right in. So here are the names of all the people who are participating. Artie, Artie from ITD, Vince from DOT, Christine Kinyip, and Kevin, all from the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation here to share some great information with us about our Center of Excellence for Data and what we're going to do. Um, our first area here is to talk through what our, so I just introduced the team. Uh, we're gonna orient around some of our issues. We're gonna talk about some of our approach. Uh, we're gonna look back a little bit to orient and get folks um, connected to what, what has happened in the past. Some have been around this for a bit and some have not. So let's get to where we were before. We're gonna dig uh, deep, deeply dig with DOT. And then we're also gonna look for some quick victories here. Um, to help us here, we have to keep aligned to our city roadmap. I first would like to apologize to me. I know we, this is the prior version with the colors on it that we're not supposed to have. And so this is the colored version, but that's okay. Um, but so really our data strategy is touching everything that's on our roadmap, but it, some key areas that we can dig through is on our digital equity, our drive to digital, our effective teams, our city workforce and diversity, but really the data activity is going to happen throughout all of these different strategies, but we wanna talk briefly here about some key ones that pop out. 
but because we need to align all our work to our, our roadmap that this is really key to that. Going back to the Wayback Machine, this slide's been used several times before, but really it shows, it's a, one of our classic images to talk about the directionality of where our data problems and challenges and opportunities are going. Um, what's interesting and in looking back to see how much data has been generated, every, going all the way back to 2012, every year it says 90% of the data of the world today has been created in the last two years. When I was looking at it, it was like in 2012, it was the case in 2013, it was the case in 2019, it was the case that 90% of the data that the world has today was created in the last two years. So this asymptotic problem set of dealing with city data and all data is something that we will be wrestling with and we will be endeavoring to get this slide updated and kind of as we explore and keep moving, what happens beyond what looks like just past 2020 where we are. Where do we find ourselves? You know, some general observations. Um, our, our data is fractured, as our spatial data was, and, and those who have been around, I've had presentations around our spatial data for about the last half decade, and, and kind of talking about what we've done around spatial data. Um, it's fractured. It's, uh, we have about 70 different applications that are kind of authoritative city data sets that are creating all sorts of different data around this, plus commercial data, but ours is, is all over the place. We have what I've described me as many vectors of input. Things are coming from all over the place, whether it's just paper inputs that people are bringing us, whether we have sensors or information coming in from our heating systems or vehicles or whatever, it's all over the place. Um, and they're stored in many locations. And so we have a, a fractured data structure, things coming in from many places, and it's hanging out and stored in many areas. Um, and sometimes there's not really obvious system connectivity. Um, and that makes it hard for us to kind of come up with interesting, innovative, and creative ways to use it. Um, and many of our approaches have been singular. We want to solve it. We have this one problem, so people wrestle around it and get to one single place, and it's, it's not really sustainable. It's these one-off scenarios. But I don't want to kind of paint this picture that nothing's being done with data or no good work is being done. There's lots of good work being done, and we're going to hear from both um, Artie and Vince and from the Modi team about work that is going on there in these different areas. But our DOT paving crews are thinking like, how do they schedule out and plan? It's not just the engineering approach. They're looking for ways to be consistent across geographic and economics and all sorts of other ways to think, how should we be paving our streets? I know that's done in our small cells. I know our ESD stormwater folks and our, our climate smart people, they're all thinking about how ways and, and being informed by the decisions of their operations through data. So to say we're not using data, it's incorrect. We are, but it, and these, but our city departments are, are incredibly interested to be driven by data, but there's gaps in know-how know -how, and there's caverns in capacity. And so like we have this giant gap between what we want to do, how to do it and, and some capacity and we're gonna work through that. So what are, what is our strategies? What are our strategies here? So we're gonna adjust our organizational approach. We're gonna align the non-spatial data in the same way we did. So we're aligning it to the GIS Center of Excellence. That's why um, public works assistant public works directors here talking about, um, I run the spatial data program. And so, and we have done a lot of work over the last decade around our spatial data. We're gonna align our data approach to have a singular data approach. We're adding a data equity lead resource. The mayor's June budget message was directed to have um, a data equity lead person, that position is in recruitment right now. And so we'll hopefully have that person on soon. We're gonna take the learnings from that spatial data successes and influence and tactics. And so we're talking about strategy, but influence and tactics. What did we do around the spatial data that created some of the success? What were the learnings? Well, we enunciated a long-term target, something like we created an available data repository that's organized and sustainable. So we created this, We we came up with something on the spatial side, so we need to have that same thing. So we're gonna learn, learn and use that. Plan for um, a sustained effort. We're, th this is going to be a bunch of work. This is going, we're going to lean on this. We're gonna keep working on this and we're gonna build a strong foundation. So this will be consistent and something from which we can build. We're gonna communicate data standards. You're gonna hear from RT about something about the open data community architecture. So we'll have an open, we're gonna have a data standard that's reasonable and flexible and then where there is internal momentum and talent, we're gonna shove and run, and you're gonna hear like that from, about stuff like that from Vince. But we're gonna to have to do these data chores. This is work. There is stuff that has to happen, and we need to have the know-how and capacity to do this work. We're gonna talk about 
and so this teach and train the organization. What's interesting, the GIS program, we've been, we've been hosting trainings around the GIS technologies for about a decade. About, and it's not just about training on the tools, you help that because then those people we train help evangelize, evangelize about what can be done. And it's always not, it's always about teaching how to execute with the tool, but how to ask questions and to see what's possible to really get, get the thinking. This education piece really, you know, in my mind, it goes beyond what today's staff is and what we think we need to be thinking for the long haul. We need to partner with high schools and universities. And what's interesting over the weekend, one of the Freakonomics podcasts came out and was talking about a curriculum around an introduction to data science curriculum in high schools. And we need to advocate and help the school districts come up with ways to implement so we can have folks that are trained from the very beginning of so they're coming to our organization with a data mindset. I mean, even the college board um, is including data fluency concepts in the SAT and not just in the math section, in the, in, in the verbal section as well. So we need to teach and train the organization, but we need to be thinking beyond just the folks that are here right now. But we cannot miss these quick victories. And you hear some of those things from the Modi team about things, what I'm describing as quick victories. If you do some work and the team is able to execute on them and then you're able to find great value in the organization. So as you would expect, there'll be things like OKRs that come out um, and we'll have objectives that we described that look a lot like this. In fact, they'll probably be these broad objectives to democratize the value of the data, foster these communities of practice, and then enable data-driven actions and decisions. And we have um, strategies underneath each one of those objectives, which will then will come out with key results that we'll be measuring ourselves by for achieving and goals and and at the baseline, so you'll have these data, we'll create these metrics and we'll drive and report out on performance. I'm gonna look back, I'm gonna hand this off to Arti and she's gonna talk about what she's built in IT and how she's part partnering with multiple departments. Arti. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson, co no, Council Members. I'm Arti Tangri, I'm Data Architect with the city's IT department. Um, um, just taking us back uh, five years when we started to publish um, open uh, data sets on our open data portal and we released our open data policy, um, we um, um, started to publish additional data sets as well at the same time, but then the additional data sets didn't really help bring more usage for the open data portal. And it turned out most of the usage that we saw was internal where city employees were trying to access the published data sets. That led us to believe that there was an internal need for data that needed to be addressed um, and that we needed to rethink how we approach data in the city. With that, we decided to take a holistic approach in understanding the usage and management of data in the city by focusing on technology, people and processes. On the technology side, we published our open data community architecture or ODCA, which was four years ago that we published it. It lays out our approach to data management for the city. The city open data environment is the phased implementation of the ODCA, which is intended to provide support for traditional as well as IoT data at scale. We'll dive uh, into more details in code in the next few slides. The technology alone cannot help meet our goals. That's where people come in. We need to build the organizational muscle by building skills in the city to allow the use of data. Under processes, we need to have data governance in place to allow for management of data throughout its life cycle, covering all aspects of usage, security, and privacy. We're also focusing on data journalism by publishing data stories that add narratives around data and helps with public engagement and lastly, having the right processes in place to embed data in our decision-making process. I like to compare our data approach to a library where city open data environment is the library building structure that is stacked up with books or data in our case. And we need to continue to staff it with people with the right skills to maintain and use it and have the right processes to maintain the data fluidity. Next slide, please. We'll get a little technical now as we try to understand the underlying technology. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Here's a simplified form of our open data community architecture. 
what we see on the left are the data sources, some, of, uh, some on our city-owned infrastructure and some on the cloud. To the right of the data sources is what we call an extract, transform, load, or ETL process. The data that's captured in the systems is transactional and not necessarily fit for analytics. The ETL process in the middle helps, helps us pick and choose and clean up the data to make it fit our analytical needs. On the bottom right is our city open data environment where the cleaned, uh, where the cleaned up analytical data needs to reside. The final and the most used consumption endpoint for the data are, uh, are on the top right. The city's open data portal, the data visualization tools, be it Power BI or Tableau, advanced analytic tools uh, for data science and machine learning. This is where we would see the most usage where data would transform into more meaningful insights that would help inform decisions. Next slide, please. Some more details on the city open data environment. With our infrastructure refresh last year, we purchased half a petabyte of storage dedicated to support our, support our data work. To put some scale here, half a petabyte of storage is equivalent to 500 terabytes or 500,000 gigabytes of storage. To put things into context, the size of our Amanda permitting database with 20 plus years of transactional data and the size of our financial management database with 30 plus years of transactional data is around 300 gigabytes each. With half a petabyte of storage, we do have enough storage capacity to support our data, data analytics needs for next couple of years and more storage can be added on, added on if we need it. Three years ago, when we started building City Open Data Environment with the view of having an unstru unstructured data lake to support all our needs, while that would have been an ideal and easy to manage scenario, it is not the most practical. Some of the changes we have made in the last one and one and a half years is around creating data partitions. The raw file storage is like the cold storage for archiving historical and rarely used data files. The structured data partition will primarily be the most used partition here as that is the most widely adopted method of data storage in the city. Uh, IT, Public Works, Department of Transportation have their own structured data warehouses in place that can potentially be moved over to this centralized location. In fact, IT and DOT have already started to work on that. The last partition in, is the unstructured data, which is critical for us to have to be able to manage IoT data at scale. We built a Hadoop data warehouse using open source technology. However, there are maintainability issues that still need to be sorted out and the fast changing technology makes it harder to manage. We also need to work on building the organizational muscle around this technology to be able to manage and use it. This piece is like a research and development on our end till we actually find the right fit for the city. Next, please. And with that, I'd like to move on, uh, pass it on to Vince, who, who's going to talk about uh, all the interesting stuff DOT has been doing with data. Thanks for that, uh, RT. And greetings, chairman, committee members, and members of the public. Um, I'm Vince Pereira, DOT IT manager. And to start off, I just wanted to uh, do a little uh, recognitions for so it doesn't get lost in the presentation. Because what I'll be talking about, it came with a great deal of teamwork as we've been building this out. So uh, Rob and RT, a great deal of help and support from the data repository side of things. Uh, Ramses and Wilson Tam from planning with their efforts. Jesse Mintz Ross for the Vision Zero planning. And then our internal data analytics system was built by uh, William Harmon, Paulo Cervantes, Robert McKay, and Kyle Tamako. Um, and they helped develop our internal analytics system, which I'll briefly go through. And then I just wanted to preface this. This is a more of a technical presentation, but it, the core is data. And going back to what Rob was saying, when it comes to equity, when it comes to safety. Data is information. Information can be extremely powerful to help build a better and safer San Jose if we use it 
in a responsible and an accurate way. So that's what my intent is. That's what my vision is as we move forward with all of these strategies that we've been working with. So with that, I wanted to start off with some of the logistical changes that EOT has been working on over the past uh, 12 to 18 months since I've been here. And that's really um, cross collaboration. We've been trying to work together across divisions, across some departments to make sure that we are sharing information around data strategies. We wanna make sure that redundant efforts aren't going uh, in parallel. Uh, we're, we wanna increase efficiency, we wanna reduce cost. We wanna leverage each other's data content and everything else that they're doing so that we could be a more cohesive data, data strategic uh, entity that's moving forward. Some of our data sources that we use come from Salesforce. Salesforce is our Unity application that we use for uh, DOT day-to-day -day activities. Um, we have workflows and assets within that system that rolls up into many of the transportation uh, uh, activities that we do. We have our reporting zone, like RT had mentioned, and that's going to be migrated over to the ITD data lake as well. That's going to contain primarily structured, unstructured, and spatial data uh, using MATS as we platform our database data. And we do have some Excel and CSV extracts that would fit under the unstructured data sets. We also use system and application data. This is data that uh, some of our partners that we're working with or even internal, we're attaching to the application directly and using some application interfaces to pull data directly from the application itself. If we roll that up into an IoT space, that's where we would get into machine data and things like that, uh, which we which we haven't gotten to, so I didn't put it on the slide, but that's the evolution of it. And we also have third-party data that we're working with within our partners as well. Um, Arab provides third-party data, and that basically expands and increases the data sets that we could actually work with to triangulate more accurate data analytics, if you will. With all of this data, we are making sure that security, digital privacy is at the highest level. We're following every standards that Rob has within ITD, that Marcelo has within uh, cybersecurity to make sure that we are not exposing anything that we should not be exposing from a security standpoint or from a privacy standpoint. And what we've done um, in partnership with uh, RT and the ITD Data Lake, we also have external partners, Urban Logic, who did a presentation, I believe, uh, one or two uh, smart city council meetings ago. Um, they are a full stack data, plat uh, data analytics platform. And Arab is a urban planning uh, expert expertise within the urban transportation areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. This slide right here, I try to categorize our analytics into two core pieces right now, general analytics and advanced analytics. General meaning this is our internal analytics system that we've built. And it's, I don't want to say it's lower level. <laughs> it's very, um, it's very intense and it's it, a lot of work has been put into this, but it's um, basically taking a fewer amount of data sets, putting it in a, into our reporting zone, which is our data repository right now. We import this into Power BI. Power BI is a business information intelligence system, which does the analytics for us. We massage the data, we clean the data, and we do some prepping prior to going through the analytics piece. We've used it for several things um, within project coordination, vision, vision zero, and planning. We also try to use this as our incubation place because we don't want to waste money doing this with Urban Logic and figuring it out. We'd rather try to do things here, make sure that we fully understand what we're looking for and the outputs and the use cases that are going to drive us then we pass those over for deep learning within the uh, urban logic system. So we've done this uh, some cases here 
or project coordination tool. It's anyone within DOT could go into the system, say you're in sewers and you're looking to see if there's any project conflicts coming up and you see that, oh, the pavement team is gonna pave this road and I, I have a sewer project. Well, I'm gonna communicate and I'm gonna collaborate with the pavement team because I'm gonna do my sewer project first rather than them paving it. And then us going back in <laughs> and digging it up. Some simple things like that or uh, we've used it for auditing purposes around vehicle abatement uh, to, to identify resources and SLAs we have identified within that scope. So it's used for many different cases um, and it's continued to continuing to grow in scale. Uh, the next uh, slide, Matt, please. This is a little bit um, deeper in, this is our advanced analytics, what I would call it. This is working with Urban Logic. So, like I said, Urban Logic is a full stack data analytics platform. I'll go into the layers of that stack later on in the presentation. But this is where we're taking our data sources and then we're adding even more data to it. We're working with Arab, for example, for on the planning side. We're increasing our data sets with Envision Zero and we're pushing this into the Urban Logic. Uh, data repository that, th that they host physically and logically. Logically meaning they tap into some of our vendors that we use for and go directly to, into their applications and through the APIs, the application interfaces, they pull that data into their platform. And from their platform, they basically will uh, generate use cases and outputs that we are requesting for them to do. When I say we, it's usually the experts within that group. So for the planning group, there's a team, for example, Ramses. For Vision Zero, there's Jesse. They're defining uh, key performance indicators or outputs to start getting the visualization of where we are today. As we move forward, we'll move into machine learning. You can answer the question. Sorry? Yep. Go ahead, Vince. I think we just had an unmuted. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, I think I was done with that slide. So the next slide, Matt, please. This is just breaking down the layers a little bit. There's a lot that goes along, goes around every layer. So I'm simplifying it. <laughs> so at the bottom layer, we basically have our repo, our data repository. We currently have structured, unstructured, and application data. Just so that people know, structured data is usually database uh, data. There, it's structured, it's in tables, it's very defined. Unstructured data are file and content, usually coming from an Excel file or a CSV file, those types of things. Um, application and system data, that's data that's attaching directly to the application itself and we're pulling data through the application interface into the Urban Logic platform. This next layer up is the data engineering and data normalization layer. I have this highlighted because this is probably the most tedious part to do. <laughs> and I'm thankful for Urban Logic that they do it <laughs> because basically their software and intelligence can normalize data. We, at the simplest form, if you want an example of no, data normalization is if we have a data set that could be put in the system in different ways or different formats, this is where the normalization will take place. For example, if you have a phone number and you enter it in as parentheses 408-123-4567, and another person or another application enters in that same phone number as 408-123-4567, and then another person, they don't use dashes or parentheses, they just put it in as 408-123-4567. Those are all equal. And so that's where the normalization comes out. It could be a street sign, for example, street, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E or S-T period, or S-T. So that's, that's a, those are just examples of normalizing data. When we get to that point, as RT pointed out as well, and even uh, Matt, these are crucial because analytics, data science is only as good as the data it's working with. And so if it's not clean, if it's not accurate, 
our analytics are not going to be clean. It's not going to be accurate. And so we need that so that we could do the mining properly. We could do the data science right. We could write our algorithms to a T so that we're producing that output that we need. And that takes us to the next layer, which is the outputs. So I've compiled predictions, machine learning, and AI within the space as well, because it's all part of the outputs. As we build on this and we get historical data and we could start modeling our machine learning to learn from that data, we could start doing predictions. We could do predictive modeling. We can anticipate what may happen if we do some changes in a good way and a bad way. But that's the way we get there. It starts from the analytics piece goes up to the learning piece, and then it basically reports up to us in a visualization layer. So these are the outputs that we see. These are the user-friendly things saying, hey, in this council district, we have these things going right, these things going wrong, <laughs> and whatnot. It's the visual piece of it. So each layer is important. In this particular slide, I wanted to point out the tedious part of the data engineering and normalization piece, because that is uh, such a key important uh, component within here. And I'll go into in depth a little bit more on the next slide. This one, same, same uh, stack, different objective here. Just to take a step back, prior for, to me coming to the city uh, a couple years ago, I was in data and technology for about 20 years. Everything that Matt says, as I said earlier, was 100% accurate. Data has grown, I wouldn't say exponentially, but it probably is. If we think about bits to bytes, to kilobytes, to megabytes, to terabytes, to petabytes, now exabytes, think about that scale. Think about how much data we have. If we don't do it right from day one, it gets lost. That bottom layer, I compiled these two layers together, but that bottom layer is our foundation. This is where data architecture has to be done very methodically, and it has to be done right. It has to be organized. It has to be documented. It has to be able to scale so that we're not spending 80% of our time cleaning up data, and that's only 20% of our time. If we do that, everything else works perfectly. But it is so key. When I was uh, in the private sector, when we would go into companies, we'd ask a simple question like, what data do you have and what's it used for? It was a blank look that we usually got because they had so much data <laughs> and they really didn't know what every piece was used for. So that's where we could learn from that. And we could start today, like Matt started with the spatial data, we could do that with every piece of data that we have and control that piece. And then we could scale horizontally, adding more use cases to this, or more ver or vertically, where we could get more precise and you have better outcomes and outputs from that data. So the bottom layers are key. That's the foundation of our house. And we could build the application on top of that. If we do that right, again, analytics will be more accurate. And if analytics are ac accurate, our predictions will be more precise. And so it, it, it needs every piece to work off of, but the foundation, if it's broken, we're gonna be altering our analytics and our predictions forever. So with that, hopefully this was helpful and informational. That's kind of sum, sums up the data work that we've been doing in DOT over the past year. Thanks, Vince. We're gonna move on to our our Modi team, and we're going to talk about some quick victories that they've uh, experienced and um, some great demonstrations of work they've done. So on to you, Christine. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. We go to the next slide. I just want to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to present our data equity analysis on San Jose 301, which is a project that we started working on January of this year. Um, our data equity pilot is you know, su supported by a um, supported by the Knight Foundation and was also mentioned in the mayor's June budget message where Mayor Licardo wrote, all the talk about equity means little if we're not measuring outcomes and driving results with concrete actions towards those outcomes. 
And so data equity at a glance, we have to date completed six projects with various city departments. Our data equity team is made up of individuals who have been historically underrepresented in the tech industry. And we believe that data is not simply an intellectual exercise. We believe that if done right, it reveals choices and creates opportunities to drive equitable outcomes for our residents. Next slide. And we're really proud to have worked with talented individuals from career changers to local high schoolers and young technologists who are experiencing public sector work for the first time. We've cultivated the partnerships listed on this slide, universities, data science boot camps, and nonprofits to build a talent pipeline into local government. It is because of these partnerships that we've recruited a diverse team that represents the communities we serve. In fact, two of our data equity fellows are currently pursuing masters in data analytics at San Jose State University. And we're so excited that we have data scientists from San Jose working on programs that directly impact their communities. The next slide. I'm also excited to introduce some of them, um, you know, who will be presenting later today. So. Um, I joined the mayor's office on technology and innovation as a Harvard Business School Leadership Fellow, which is a program that places MBAs into high impact roles in the public sector. Uh, my career in the private sector spans high growth technology companies and hedge funds, which are organizations that pioneer data driven performance. But I've been serving in the public sector since the beginning of the pandemic. I joined the city from the US Small Business Administration, where I was part of a COVID-19 task force using data to improve improve access to the Paycheck Protection Program. One of our presenters today is Kevin Shaw, who is the facilitation lead for San Jose 311. Kevin is a designer and researcher who has previously worked for um, the Mayo Clinic uh, and at Fast Company's most innovative startup. He was a US Department of State Fulbright Scholar in China, where he focused on community health research with the LGBTQ community. And Kevin received his bachelor's in international studies and global health from the University of Washington. Our other presenter, Kinyip Chen is the technical lead for San Jose 311. Kinyip is a data scientist and he has overseen a team of five that has improved the data quality and drove the technical analysis of the 311 tickets. Kinyip received his master's in statistics from Texas A&M University and was also a data science instructor at Galvanize, which is a leader in the IT career education. In the next slide, I want to start by thanking Harvard data scientist Matthew Finney, as well as Zolma, Andrea, and Haima from the Office of Racial Equity for helping us develop and refine this framework. Because we know that equitable outcomes look different for each department, we developed a framework that helps departments define equity outcomes, track and uh, measure progress over time. An important distinction um, is that we're analyzing administrative data rather than just survey data, because we know that survey data with low response rates can introduce bias, whereas city system data, right, so something like registration data for the PRNS programs is a more robust and flexible data source. We're also creating operating metrics that enable policymakers to measure program performance and create targeted solutions. So next, I will hand it over to Kevin, who over the past two quarters have convened nine workshops with all 311 stakeholders to establish a data equity objective and metrics. Next slide. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm now gonna take us deeper into the creation of our equity objective for SJ311, which we accomplished over a series of three workshops in spring of this year. The purpose of an equity objective is to set a vision of where we want to go as a department. Therefore, it should be qualitative, aspirational, and representative of the collective vision of the department. It should be something that the whole department will ideally unify around and use. Therefore, we knew we had to go about this process with a lot of care and collaboration. In the framework that Christine and Matt created, we set out to craft an objective by posing the question, what is an equitable outcome for your department and programs? And you can imagine this is a challenging question to answer for a set of services as broad and diverse as SJ311. Next slide, please. This slide will show you the exceptional breadth of SJ311 services. Um, and many of the service owners are here today and were instrumental in this work. 
Um, and I also want to thank um, ITD's Herman Sedano, um, Jerry Dreesen, and Artie Tangri, um, as well as uh, Patricia Wei and Kevin Wang um, for all of your support and leadership. Um, so we can see here SJ311 covers graffiti, illegal dumping, abandoned vehicles, residential garbage and recycling, streetlight outages and potholes, not to mention other issues, which itself is a very diverse category of services. Um, so how do you go about shaping a single objective that works for all of these different services? Well, it needs to be collaborative, it needs to be co-created, and that's why uh, we drew on design thinking approaches to structure conversations that would allow everyone to contribute towards this common objective and make sure that it fit the various needs and situations of different SJ311 service areas. Um, next slide, please. The process of crafting the objective ended up taking three big steps. Uh, and these weren't pre-planned. This is what we uh, found out worked well in the process of doing it. Um, first, we ideated the equity objectives. And what that means is we simply created a space for all the SJ311 services to contribute ideas um, as to what they thought the objective could be, um, where they thought we should focus on equity. Uh, next, Herman Sedano took those objective ideas, boiled them down into a few sample options, and then we brought them back to the larger group for discussion. Then we boiled that conversation further down into a single sample objective that with the group we workshopped and refined until we felt we had language that worked. Um, and you'll see that on the next slide. Empower all who live, work, and play in San Jose, especially underreporting and heavily impacted communities, to submit reports via SJ311 and ensure that services are delivered per committed turnaround times. This is the SJ311 equity objective as it stands. And while it might seem straightforward, it's actually the result of intense discussion and co-creation. Each word in here is a specific meaning and intention. For example, an earlier iteration used the phrase San Jose residents instead of what you see here. Um, it became clear during our conversations that some services also serve people passing through San Jose, working in San Jose, businesses in San Jose. Therefore, this language of all who live, work, and play in San Jose is a better fit for the whole department. Underreporting and heavily impacted communities also began in a different form that started as underserved. And we weighed some different options, including overburdened, and ultimately decided that underreporting and heavily impacted together better and more accurately represent what we are trying to target as a department. Um, finally, submitting reports via SJ311 and ensuring delivery per committed turnaround times. This creates a two pronged equity objective in that one is looking at empowering people to submit reports in places that are historically underreporting to be able to surface problems that they see in their areas, in their neighborhoods. And two, looks at ensuring an equitable and consistent service response. Next slide, please. So that paints a picture of how we co-created this equity objective with our SJ311 stakeholders. Um, from there, the next step was to dive deeper in how we would actually measure this. And a lot of that work was carried by our data scientists. Something that became clear during the equity objective workshops is that each service area had a unique situation and set of considerations. Different existing data practices, infrastructures, and ways of treating things like ticket closures and duplicates. Therefore, we knew we had to go back and have a series of one individual sort of with service owners, stakeholder conversations, um, and that yielded the following themes on the next slide. These are the themes that rose to the surface during those conversations. And now I'm gonna hand it off to our data science technical lead, Kenya, to talk through how these themes showed up in our data analysis work. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, first, I wanna recognize our past and current Modi fellows who have contributed to this project since January. Matt Doe, Casey Kong Panakul, Clayton Summit, and Jason Lowe were also all students or residents local to the area. Uh, so for this slide, while developing metrics for equitable service delivery, we had to consider that service providers are both proactive and reactive to service requests. Service providers proactively patrol the streets of San Jose looking for issues like graffiti, abandoned vehicles, and illegal dumping. And responding to 311 requests is the reactive component of their work. Different services have their own criteria for closing tickets, and they also have different committed 
turnaround times. Thus, no single metric is sufficient to capture service quality. Um, and also residents, businesses, and visitors don't request services equally, which can affect how we measure performance. And we also need to weigh need versus volume. Some areas log more requests, some fewer, which can affect the perception of performance, which I'll discuss uh, in the following slides. And from this information, we're developing a more granular approach to measure equity at the zip code level. And uh, the result of all this work is that we will have a pipeline to flow data into dashboards. And those dashboards will allow service owners to visualize performance on various metrics across the city and then determine how they want to allocate their staff. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have some mock-ups of the dashboards that we're working on. Uh, on the left, we're able to visualize the number of service requests coming from each zip code in the city over the last 90 days. Uh, and it, you can see that most of the tickets for this particular service come from the downtown area in dark blue, where the gray arrow is pointing. And often this is where city work stops, but we're able to combine 311 data, GIS, and census data uh, to take a deeper dive. So on the right, we normalize the service requests using the number of residents in each zip code, according to the US Census. So what's shown is the number of tickets submitted per capita. So rather than highlight areas with large populations, uh, this metric shows areas where an issue is reported a lot relative to the population size or where residents, visit, visitors, or businesses are particularly active in reporting issues. Uh, and in this case, the Alviso neighborhood becomes highlighted in Northeast San Jose where the blue arrow is pointing. Um, I don't know why that's the case for this particular service, but um, you know the individual service owners would have more knowledge to contextualize what we're seeing in these maps. Next slide, please. And so we're able to visualize those metrics and additional metrics for every 311 service. Uh, shown here is the average time to close a ticket. And we're also working on metrics for median time to close tickets and the percent of tickets that are meeting each service's committed turnaround time. Um, and you see multiple maps here because they represent each of the different services uh, associated with 311. Um, so in the end, again, uh, as we're working on these dashboards, um, by the end of this, these will be able to help service owners see how their services are performing across the city, and it will give them uh, more data, metrics, choices to help them reallocate their resources and staff to respond to 311 requests. Uh, and I'll pass it back to Christine. Thanks, Kenya. Next slide, please. And so for the final uh, stage in this process is around monitoring and evaluation, which is all about, you know, working with the city manager's office, ITD, and all the stakeholders in 311 to make sure that you know, data is integrated in the decision making and service delivery of this program. And so we are currently supporting the IT department in integrating some of the heat maps that Kenip just showed you into dashboard, um, you know, into internal tools and dashboards um, that can be used for, you know, continuous monitoring and evaluation. Um, we're also planning to publish a data story on the city's open data portal to encourage inc uh, community stakeholders to engage with the city's open data. And in the next slide, um, Matt had already mentioned some of these items on our roadmap in his opening, but uh, we're also excited to share that, you know, this fall we are supporting interim deputy city manager Dolan Beckel and the Office of Civic Innovation in hiring the city's first ever data equity lead. And the job posting is now live, so please help us spread the word. Um, we are also working with Assistant Director of Human Resources, Kelly Parmley, to design a data analytics training for city employees as part of um, the, you know, her learning and development program. These investments will increase the City Hall's capacity to define, measure, and drive equitable outcomes for San Jose residents. Thank you for your time. Next slide. We're at the stage where we're ready for questions. Excellent. All right. And excellent feedback. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, to Matt, RT, Vince, Christine, Kenyip, and Kevin. Really great presentation. Appreciate it. And for my 
uh, you know, fellow committee members and members of the public, we put the most technical presentation first. So it is, it is all downhill from here. We're gonna uh, head over to public comment before the committee discusses. And I believe we're starting with Tessa. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, that was a very impressive uh, program. I appreciate everybody's energy about it, especially Matt Loesch or something, who was really very so enthusiastic. We need that enthusiasm to address our biggest issue, which we are all facing, which is our climate crisis. And we need to use these tools. This is uh, what so my this item is data infrastructure and services. Yes, I know, Matt, I know. And I'm saying that we need to use our data informat and structure to look at how we're using our fossil fuel. And that is the, um, that's what we have to start doing is that this is a great infrastructure program. Thank you for all your enthusiasm for creating uh, a data, you know, data driven, data driven systems and, and creating that infrastructure to do that. And now we need to put the most important critical information uh, for our survival uh, into this program in terms of how the city is running. That is what we need to do. That is what needs to go into our, our city charter as we need to put in our city charter the, re, the going to, to zero fossil fuel use for our survival. And so the thing is, is that's what I'm saying, is that we need to look at every department, every, every way we're using it. We are putting equity in. We have an equity department. We have equity into everything. We need to put that lens of climate climate uh, intense climate action into our into our ev every aspect of our operation and this is a perfect way where it needs to go is it needs to start with getting all the data from all the departments and all city owned operations what is the fossil fuel use of these operations and that needs to be shared with the public so that we can we should know that that's a very critical part it needs like you said it needs to be disclosed you know, you, you know, to create, you know, the everybody know what's going on. And, and yes, that's what has to happen in terms of our data of how our fossil fuel is being used. And we need to really make a, um, a, a adult conversation and, it, 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 you know, anyway, we need to Thank reduce you. it to zero. Thank you. Okay, over to Paul. Um, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'm gonna try to be as polite as I can because the uh, my goal with what I'm about to say is more important than my feelings. And that was probably one of the most disrespectful, absolutely verba esoterica. That was nothing but verbiage that was esoteric. You have to have a high level. I mean, I probably heard the word data 180 times. And you think that this is boss. Let me tell you something about a Native American. Our bodies are hot spots. And what that means is, is that we received an invisible signal from far away, and then we transmitted it. The body, we have six to eight hertz in our brain. We have six to eight hertz in our heart because we've got electricity in it. We've got six to eight. Do you know what the earth vibrates on? Six to eight hertz. So when we had ceremony and we aligned our body with that frequency, boom, it amplified it. So we don't need, and in fact, Native Americans didn't have written language. That's why they, the Navajo talkers were able to drop that bomb. Why? Because this country used them. Why? Because we know something that you don't. Every single one of you people, you Paul, Paul we're, we're off topic. No, this is, no, this is not on topic. This has to do with data. This has everything to do with data. Do you know what you just did? You disrespected us because you expect us, the public, to understand and comprehend that? You got to be kidding, man. You don't, 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 don't talk to me like that. That it was disrespectful. That entire presentation was disrespectful. Is what it was. Okay, we're on to Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, the third in a series of our of our public input for yourselves uh, that uh, for growth, help, and understanding. Um, I um, 
to mention the ideas. Uh, I, I talk so often about surveillance and uh, technology ordinance ideas and how incredibly uh, they offer an incredible array uh, of different choices of, 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 of democracy and, and good practices, civil rights, civil protections. Uh, it, it just, uh, it's, it's never ending how much uh, these practices can help ourselves. I honestly was impressed with this item today because it showed me that you guys have, you're, you're showing ways to really address the future of issues like say cybersecurity, which really, really needs a, uh, a, a component of open democratic practices. And you're doing that here today. So thank you for that effort. Um, you know, Paul and I have talked frequently that, you know, that you guys are gonna be dealing with uh, uh, AI issues coming up this fall, and um, you're going to be trying out new AI systems. I don't know if you quite mentioned that here today. Maybe that would have helped Paul understand things better. So those are going to be a little bit difficult and tricky. And if you've noticed, city government, uh, at city council meetings, committee meetings, they've made a real interesting commitment to projects uh, this August and hopefully into September. They're trying to be open. They're trying to be factual what we can be expecting this fall and into the next few years. It's very heartening uh, considering all the events of the VTA and stuff. So they're putting their best foot forward to try to introduce really good open democratic practices, you know, humane practices, humanistic practices, factual, you know, data and input for ourselves as community to think about. I hope that these good efforts can, can be an important help for yourselves, how you work with this AI. Thank stuff. you. Thank you. Okay, let's come back to the panel. And, you know, I'll just say as um, my fellow committee members think of their questions and comments, um, while this was a fairly technical presentation, I, I do see real value in all of us having a grounding in some of the, the key concepts, even just the exponential growth of the data we're collecting or some of the difficulty of normalizing data and being able to actually use it. And so I, I just, I do appreciate you all giving us a little bit of insight into the, the infrastructure you're building, the work you're doing every day. And the, I found the last segment, of course, the applied part to be uh, particularly inspiring. So I just appreciate the, the hard work you're all doing to give us more data capabilities. So why don't we uh, jump into um, comments and questions? And I think we'll start with Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And um, I appreciated the presentation. There was a lot in there to digest um, and a lot of uh, varying layers there, obviously the technical and then down to the applied at the end. Um, maybe I missed it at the beginning. I have a question about where we're storing all this data. Um, obviously, we're going, we have exponential growth in data. Uh, as we know, there's just so much data from various departments. Um, and you know, and everything in the world is getting is is data centric. Um, we talked you talked about the half a petabyte of data that's going to last us a couple of years, and we're going to be expanding that over time. Is that this is obviously cloud based storage? What what are what are we doing? Where are we storing this as a city? And um, what are our partners as far as our um, where we're keeping this data? So I'll, I'll start off um, and then we'll kick it into some of the conversation from Artie and Rob probably and some of the details. Um, many of the systems are stored. So of the 70 some city systems, almost all of that is stored on local systems here in San Jose and in drives within IT. We sh most of us share into the basic um, database infrastructure that ITD stores. There are some other disparate systems that have their own database infrastructure. Um, some of them do back up to clouds and that, so it would vary based on all the different systems that are there um, in terms of how it hits to the things that RT was describing. I need to lean to them to exactly what that precise mechanism going between them. Uh, sure, uh, I think uh, the half of petabyte of storage that we have that is on premise. So that is in our infrastructure. Uh, our eventual goal is to have a hybrid model so that we can have some data on premise and some on cloud, depending on the use case. But as of now, we're focusing on on premise. And once we master that, we would move to the cloud. And I can add one more layer on that, Council, uh, Council Member Cohen. Um, and that's by design is we have an internal high hygiene um, 
um, source for things that are of analytical use across departments at low cost. There's on top of that a share layer with um, additional security saying who can plug in on what specific data sets, but allows us to control that, that access and, and egress. Now, on top of that, you have the city data portal, which is stuff that has gone through uh, two layers of checking so that we then publish only safe information to the public. Uh, and so that design is there. There is an architecture as soon as we can work out the, some of the, the um, procurement and design issues about how we connect that to some cloud sources and maximize our use of, of um, some data specific clouds um, that are out there um, that'll help us with analytics in the future at a faster pace and better price point. Um, but that's still in, in, um, in kind of R&D for us. And I know storage is relatively inexpensive now, so we're doing a lot of that just on our own servers. Yeah, the, uh, and actually our cost point on storage is, is lower than the outside. Um, storage can be cheap, but at analytics and performance levels, um, not, not as uh, cheap as internal, at least right now. So we're still seeing when we do our calculations that that internal use model um, layered on with hybrid is the most optimal. Um, we do expect clouds to get cheaper and cheaper on that, though, but where you need it to perform fast enough for um, selects and, and uh, analysis, that isn't as cheap as we would like it to be yet. Do we have anybody doing um, sort of cleanup of our old data to make sure that we're not storing data that's unnecessary, or are, and are we doing compression in order to optimize storage, or is that just not worth the time? Um, both, uh, and, and Arthi can weigh in on this one as well, is um, so our, our core design is that clean data lake where it only gets in if it's clean and maintained um, and it's of, of common use. There is a lot of information and where a lot, something we discovered in our research was a lot of organizations fall down on that data cataloging and cleanup. They get stuck in that mode and then never do great uh, analytics. Um, so uh, boiling the ocean type of analogy. Um, so we do have the things that come up and are of common use are supposed to go in here and be maintained as clean and um, accessible across departmental lines so that uh, the departments don't have to recreate uh, some of the information but have clean and, and uh, quick access to it. Um, but there is a lot more information as Matt referred to in kind of that ERISA model and using um, the GIS type of approach is those base layers, base assets, base integrations that everyone can use and then they clean up what they need at the department level for use um, and also access uh, some novel data sources. Uh, but let me uh, allow Arthi and, and to Matt to weigh in as well if they if they'd like to. Yeah, I think just to add just to add to that, um, it's probably going to have to be evaluated on a use by use use case basis. So we have a wide range of some clean data and some not so clean. Some are really organized well, some are not. So as and when we work with data, I'm sure Christine and her team has had experience at both extremes and she can speak to that as well. But uh, I think uh, it will have to be evaluated and um, we'll just have to work it out as we go through it. Okay. Um, and I appreciated to see a couple of use case examples. And I know the, 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 the customer facing example of uh, 311 is a good example of how we look at data to understand our customer experience and also um, looking at, at equity and how we're applying that across the city and how we can improve service in various parts of the city. And that's a great example. And I, we didn't really see details of, of a lot of what DOT is doing with all that data, but I know there's a lot of AI work being done to try to improve um, transportation flows and other things around the city. So it's, 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 there's a lot of potential um, great work with data and DOT. I do want to, you, you know, it, um, talk a little bit about other types of data we can collect. And I know um, Tessa often brings this up, um, but I do want to kind of give a give a uh, the importance of a lot of the environmental data we can collect as a city. Um, you know, we talk about being a you know an environmental leader as a city, and talk about our our uh, carbon footprint and and understanding where our, our most impactful actions can be. And so I, I, she did raise a good point about having data that, that talks about where our various um, impacts are, our various um, uh, carbon um, releases are, and what our, whether it's in transportation or at our airport or various departments in, in, in our, or even in our community as far as where we're built, what we're doing in construction. Um, so we, there's a lot of data potential for using data to understand how we can reduce our, our, our um, climate impact and as we're seeing impacts 
happening live around us these days, this is even more important. So I, I'd be interested in seeing what we might already have as far as data in that regard or what we can collect in that regard so we can you know, become even more of a leader as a city. So since that was mentioned, I just I think it'd be great for us to know what data we even have and what kind of analysis we can do with data um, to help us drive policy. Thanks, those are my questions and comments. Thanks, council member. And I, I will note that we have a um, pretty impressive emissions inventory that I know we discussed earlier this year that I found um, worth reading through. So, um, but totally agree. There's a lot we can collect there. Okay, why don't we head over to Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for that presentation. It was very technical, and I'm sure for the technical geeks out there, they were having a field day. But for the average citizen who was watching this presentation, uh, I want to talk a little bit about use cases. And, and you touched on one use case that I thought was, was really good, and that was the whole dig once. You know, if there's a sewer repair, you know, do we want to do the sewer repair after we repave the street, which I know has happened. So I think that's a, a really strong use case. Can you give me um, a couple more examples of uh, some use cases that you know the public can really have a deeper understanding in terms of the value of uh, this data analytics? Um, and I'll direct it to Matt or Vince, whoever wants to take it. For sure, I'll just. Being, I'll touch just briefly on some of the things, and I don't want to go into all the details uh, because I probably will speak to it a little bit incorrectly. <laughs> I'm the technology guy within DOT, but we do have Vision Zero. So Vision Zero, that's one of the key reasons why I actually wanted this position two years ago when I applied for it, because it comes down to the heart of safety. It comes to the you crashes, severely injured or killed uh, people within crashes. So the Vision Zero plan is actually looking at every corridor that we have within San Jose and looking at the high accident um, corridors. And they're looking at why that's happening. They're putting together data from, from PD and from connected data that we get from uh, Urban Logic and other data that we're trying to triangulate. Why is this happening and how can we make it better? How can we make it safer? That's one of the use cases that we're working with with Vision Zero, but that is basically to try to make our streets safer. The other, another example is uh, the planning team. Planning is always forward-looking. It doesn't, it doesn't directly touch emissions and whatnot, but they're looking at bike lanes. They're looking at micro mobility uh, solutions, where if they incorporate that within city planning efforts. Is that going to be an impact in a negative or a positive way? If we get the data in where we're looking at Vision Zero data and planning data, if we put a building that's 50 feet at this intersection, how is that going to impact the safety of that street? So things like that will all triangulate and line up together. Those are some of the things that we're working on within DOT. Great. That, that's a perfect answer to my question. Uh, and my other question was around equity. Can you provide us with some examples of some of the equity outcomes that we can get from a, a data analytics type of process? I could speak to one that we are working with. I don't have the results, but um, Urban Logic has connected data that they're working with. And what they've done, not for some cities, not specifically San Jose yet, but they basically, during the COVID situation, they tracked um, ambulance routes to and from different neighborhoods to hospitals to, to make sure that the lower uh, fortunate areas were getting the same types of services or weighing that to get an uh, idea of how the more affluent areas are getting served and the less affluent areas were getting served. So that was just some initial things that they were doing during the COVID uh, pandemic. Great. Christine, Thank would you. you like to share another example? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I'm happy to build off of what Vince shared. So, um, you know, when it comes to 311, we, one of the things that we realize is that 
the tickets, you know, tickets reported in 311 may not actually be this, you know, the source of true in terms of what's actually happening in the rest of San Jose, right? Just because one community is, um, you know, seeing disproportionate amounts of ticket reporting for abandoned vehicles doesn't mean that that community actually has more abandoned vehicles than others. And so I think what's helpful with analyzing tickets in some of the ways that um, you know, Kim Kenyap was demonstrating is it just allows us to take a more nuanced approach in terms of even understanding um, if we are, um, if we, you know, if the various service owners have the capacity, right, to meet the need and whether or not even on the public engagement side, right, whether or not the tickets coming in is actually representative of what's actually happening out in the real world. And I'm actually going to turn it to Kevin because he led a lot of the deep facilitation with the service owners that will kind of lend more insight. Hi, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess in terms of shaping 311 outcomes, um, I think uh, I, I work mostly on the objective side. And so I think that um, it's still a, a little early to say about outcomes. Um, I, I will say that, uh, sorry, um, I will say that uh, building our ability to kind of even see what's going on in the city, yeah. that's an important baseline for knowing how we're doing. And then we can overlay more data onto that around what we know in terms of areas of relative socioeconomic disadvantage and deprivation onto service usage. And I think if we look at each specific 301 service that yields specific use cases, right? So you can see how abandoned vehicles requests are being serviced potentially um, in more socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Same for residential garbage and recycling, uh, same for graffiti, right? And different services have different implications when it comes to that equity lens. Um, something like street lights might be a little bit more consistent across the board, whereas things like graffiti, we know from conversation with the service owner that that is an issue that especially impacts um, certain areas more than most, disproportionately socioeconomically disadvantaged areas. And we also know that's a team that does a lot of heavy sort of street patrol in order to proactively sense where problems are and, and address them. Um, and also same with illegal dumping. And so I think uh, hopefully that gives a range of potential use cases to think about from the public's perspective. I think that's a really important question. Great. Thank you. That, that's it. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Mayor Licardo? Thanks. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody. Uh, Vince, Matt, everyone who's been working so hard on bringing us into the, the 21st century um, on, on data. I really appreciate this. this. is not easy work. There's a lot of grunt work, I think, was described, you know, and just cleaning the data, establishing architecture in, in ways that actually make this usable. So uh, thank you for all the work to get us to this point. I, I got to give a shout out though to our home team and the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation. Uh, I thought that the presentation from Christine and Kevin and Ken Yip was absolutely spectacular. Uh, and I, I might add that uh, Christine uh, sadly is transitioning uh, toward uh, her next great uh, adventure. Uh, I know she'll be around with us in a, a part-time capacity for a little while, but really want to thank her for all her hard work. Uh, and Kevin Ken, you have great uh, examples of just how uh, Christine and Jordan and, and Stephen and Clay have really built this sort of empire of really uh, bright young people, uh, both in the workforce as well as uh, students, grad students, college students, and others uh, that have really helped us enormously. So I want to say a big shout out to them. Quick question. Um, just as we look at the data uh, in terms of equity, understanding how we're doing and really responding, I noticed it was really based on zip code. And I'm guessing if you had the choice, you would have picked much smaller geographic divisions than zip codes since there's so much diversity within any one zip code. Um, I think the one you showed that was most prominent initially on complaints was 95112, which I think we all, is, a, is a very uh, diverse zip code in terms of having one or two high-income neighborhoods, some very low-income neighborhoods, obviously uh, hard to draw conclusions. It, it is, is it that we are not able to get something at the, sort of at the uh, 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 um, uh, the census tract or sub-census tract level that's that's reliable enough? Or what are some of the obstacles there? Maybe Kevin or Kenya, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, 
the obstacle is really the lack of census data. So when we analyzed it, we found that census tracts provide, um, census tracts have data for what we're looking at. Um, we can also reformulate it to look at zip codes, but in our internal discussions, census tracts and zip codes both describe similarly uh, sized regions. And census tracts are further broken down sometimes for some types of data to census blocks, which are smaller. Yeah. But unfortunately, it doesn't have um, the data that we need for certain things. Also, I mean, there's like nitty gritty stuff. Every 10 years, the shapes of those regions change. So that throws a big wrench into if you're trying to analyze things over time. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the explanation. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Fong? Thank you, uh, Matt and team for your presentation. I have to admit that my head was pretty much exploding over the first part of the data analysis. I feel it's way over my head, but uh, I'll start processing it and analyzing it a little bit and see if I can actually understand what you, what you said. But basically what you said is how we're gonna derive data and all of that. And I really appreciate that information. But I just want to focus us, us a little bit that the data is important in, in that we will use it to make decisions on how we improve the lives of our residents. And as you say, stated in one slide, uh, I think, I forget who's Vince, it's um, where, where we live, work, and play. And so when we look at all the data and we hear the analysis, it's important that we keep in mind that this is really about improving the lives of our residents for make it easier for them to report an abandoned vehicle and then get services to their, their neighborhood. I also wanna comment about the squeaky wheel uh, term that was used. Um, some of our districts may have a lot of squeaky wheels and that may be uh, an overrepresentation of the volume of activity in relation to other districts. But they're important nonetheless because if the district or the city staff isn't handling it, abandoned vehicles, for example, example, example um, then the city council staffs are left to deal with it because we're usually the first point of contact. So I just wanna keep that in mind and not to say that we should not be focusing our efforts in areas to improve equity and distribution of the services that are received. But just to keep that in mind is that someone will pick up the slack of representing our residents and it's going to be our city staff, our city council staff and each of our city council's teams are pretty small and we have a lot of issues we're managing too. So they're all, all these issues are important. I just wanna keep us focused that the data is important for what it will do in how we will analyze it in improving and setting policies that will make life better for all of our residents. And I'll leave you with that, thank you. Thanks council member, great reflections, appreciate that. Um, you know, I was going to ask the same question about census tracts, and I, my understanding was that they were smaller than zip codes, but um, the, the fact that the shape file would change every 10 years is a, is a good point. Is it, um, I have noticed though that in a lot of our reports, the unit of analysis is a census tract or even block, and I'm wondering if, if this infrastructure still enables us to do that where it feels relevant or are we um is that going to be a just too hard to do at this point are you referencing yes. the 311 system or are you referencing um any of I, the other systems yeah i guess i guess i'm thinking initially about 311 related service delivery so the 311 system first of all they're report present presenting after this which would be a great question here i know jerry's on could provide what how that data is actually stored because um, that's really how that data is collected. If it's collected with a way so that it could be located in a census block group or a census tract, we should have the aggregate um, demographics within there, but other things. And as Kenya or Kevin was intimating is, you know, it depends on what you're trying to make the connection to with that data, whether it's just demographics, education, or um, the ethnicity or uh, income levels, those things we can generally get. Um, they do change a little bit, but they don't change, the geographies don't change that much. 
decade after decade, but maybe 20, 30 years ago they might, but year to year they don't change too much. And we've done a pretty consistent exercise in, if you remember in May, June about building our first neighborhood map, which creates these neighborhoods, which is collection of block groups or tracks with named entities that people in the neighborhood can identify with. And so that's one of the exercises we'll be going through in the fall of what, how are we reporting our data? Is it by, you know, council districts, it's hard because it's not all the same and these lines are crossing. Should we do it by block group, do it by neighborhoods, do it by zip codes, and we should normalize on something consistent that we can all relate to and then have consistent reporting on. And, and Jerry wants to pipe in about the uh, SJ311. I do. Uh, Mr. Chair, Jerry Dreesen, uh, Assistant CIO. Um, so SJ311, uh, in terms of a geographic area, which an event is registered, meaning um, when I see graffiti, when I see illegal dumping, I actually drop a pin there. So it's that that data is about as geographic specific as you're going to get it's its location it doesn't tell you where the reporters from um you know so drawing analysis about um uh everybody who reports an item is from where they reported it for instance downtown you know uh, would be more difficult uh, to draw that i think what matt hit on though is um <clears throat> what you're trying to tie that um that 311 data too is more where um, the census data comes in. If you're trying to make um, uh, conclusions about household income and relationship between types of reports and those sorts of things, um, that's when the data uh, and census data becomes more important. So yeah. I, I don't, yeah. Sorry, Joe, let me just interject on that. I actually was thinking specifically in terms of the geographical area and I'll tell you why. I think that if the unit of analysis for service delivery is as large as a zip code, which in San Jose is often 50 or 60,000 people, we may see zip codes that perform at an average level that are hiding vast disparities. That's what I'm getting at. And so my understanding was that our average census tract was closer to five to 10,000 people, whereas our, and I could be wrong, but I know our zip codes, because I've looked into this, are closer to 40, 50, even 60,000 people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I just, I think the point is, less about having complex analytics of who exactly lives here and what's their education level and what's their income. That's all nice. The, the point to me though is, if you're looking at a geographical unit that encompasses 50,000 plus people, you could have vast disparities and not even know it. It could register as an average district or an average unit, right? An average zip where half of the zip might be really well served and half might be horrible but when you put it together in that unit of analysis, it looks average. So I'm actually thinking about the geographical area that we're serving. And then of course the people in it, but the more granular, probably the, the better our understanding of service gaps would be, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. perhaps this might help. I, I think in the presentation um, that Christine and the team were talking about, it, it might not be so important to focus on that particular reporting. It was a study of how this data could be used. It should be more like, uh, not as specific, but more directional of how we could be using it and more how we could be using it for an equity concept. The geography, we could change that to a different geography and present the same exact slides that have the different data report outs that come from that. And so I, really, I think we should use the presentation in terms of those slides as being more informational and kind of, this is the direction we could go, not this is the exact way the science will be studied going forward. It was really meant to be, this is how the work could be done. And it really, the precursor work is probably even way more important than the work that those actual slides came out with, the, that you're looking at the maps. The precursor work, the conversations that they were talking through with the staff is probably more important to what Christine was saying than necessarily that those maps we could produce through many different geographies. Right, and that's what, I just wanted to make sure that we, that our infrastructure was not being set up in such a oh. way as to preclude more granular geographic it, views. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think I was trying to articulate uh, apparently poorly that there, I don't think there's a, a I don't think there's a limitation with how we right. collect the SJ three on one data. Perfect. Yeah, because you're getting points on a map. Exactly. So you can draw. You can take much smaller units of analysis. That, that right. I just wanted to confirm that. Got it. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Mayor, did you want to jump in on that at all? No, no. I just appreciate okay. your points, Matt. Okay, yeah. cool, great. Um, Mr. Chair, just just to add one more thing. You know, the strategic goal of all this is we're laying the foundations for the technical work that's being done so that we could, and you know, we'll, one, we're able to get feedback uh, from yourself, you know, and, and others on these issues uh, because this work has been done and highlighted. But then I think the third part is uh, really then thinking about more long-term, what is the infrastructure uh, solutions that we want to procure, 
right? And so uh, I've seen too many organizations in the federal government that go for procurement and then figure out the use case and train up their uh, employees on how to use it. And that's always led to one failure after the next. And so we'd like to work backwards with the luxury that we have of seeing failures of cloud migration and uh, you know data transformation projects in the past in government and work backwards this time based off what works for us. So thank you. Great, Th thank you. And um, oh, I see Vince put his hand up. Hi Vince. Hi, right, sorry, just to add to that a little bit. I, th I think someone mentioned it. When you're doing geographical locations, geofencing, if you will, to determine that type of analysis, it, um, I recommend it being set from the beginning because if it's not consistent, you can't measure it. And so whatever uh, is determined to be that geographical definition that you're looking at should be set prior to the start of the project. Then we could see month over month, year over year, accurate data based on that measurement on that same data set, that same ge geographical set. Right. Thanks, Vince. And just one final question. I know we need to move on, but Christine, I, I want to say it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna greatly miss you. And thank you for lending your talent, uh, your talents to the city. I, I did want to uh, close this item with a question to you, which is just as as you're meeting with the the service providers, the, the departments that are providing some of these services that you all be, began to analyze uh, and shared a little bit about in your presentation. I'm just curious qualitatively what those conversations have been like have you had any aha moments or departments learning things that maybe they didn't know or and what you know do you have any i don't know any final reflections to leave us with as you eventually head off to greener pastures yeah first of all i just want to say it has been it, it really has been an honor and i mean i'm still i'm still here in a part-time capacity so you can't get rid of me that quickly yet um but i so I'll share my reflections and then I'll pass it over to Kevin, who was also part of these conversations. And I mean, for the 311 service owners, you know, key ICU social, um, you know, feel free to also unmute and jump in as well. But um, I would actually say, so the one that the biggest learning for me has actually been thinking about um, the role 311 plays in our community, especially like what and how it actually, you know, became more significant during COVID-19. I would actually say in some ways, you know, us kind of moving into a digital first government at the height of the pandemic actually made the tickets more insightful, right? Because in some ways, all the other channels of reporting, um, although Council Member Foley, I'm sure you were still getting, I'm sure you were still getting reported to. And so you should forward those emails to us so we can add it to the repository, right? But in some ways we actually thought it was more accurate, right? Because 311 really became that main, that main source. And I think running that analysis was interesting because it really made us question how, like how accessible it was, right? Like what Kevin was sharing was actually looking at variants across the different service types. But one of the projects that, you know, Jordan and Clay also led was even looking at the design of the platform, right? So let's not even look at, like, let's beyond even looking at what's already in the system, you know, thinking about, you know, are we, you know, are we inclusive enough? Are we accessible enough in terms of even usage, right? Can folks actually download this app, right? Do folks have a strong enough connection? Is it, is the flow intuitive? Is the language, you know, is the language is even if translated, does, does it make sense to our core constituents? I thought that was actually really interesting um, feedback that came up um, organically in the conversations around equity. Kevin, any? Thanks, Christine. And, and yeah, I, I would be really curious if any of the service owners who are here would like to just comment on whether or not our conversations were helpful to them. Um, that would be super welcome. Um, and I guess just for my part, um, aha moment for me was just a greater appreciation for the work that public service workers in the city do. Each service area has different sophisticated means of understanding where need is and resolving it. And uh, working with limited resources in really smart ways to cover the city and sense where uh, needs are, including related to equity. And I think um, just one that stuck out to me was illegal dumping. And when we sat with the team, um, they showed us these GIS maps that they had made to, to mark where different uh, areas and sections of the of the city were in really pretty granular ways with regards to need and scheduling that 
um, to different team members to address different neighbors at different times in order to, to make the best use of the resources they have to address the need that was there. Um, so I really came away with a great appreciation for that work. And I invite any, anyone to, to chime in. Join once. Okay, I'm going to give Councilmember Foley the last word and hopefully a uh, motion as well. Sure, I'll make the motion to accept the staff report. Second. <laughs> okay, good. And I just I just wanted to follow up on something that Christine said. Sure. Christine San Jose 311 is a great app, and that's actually where our residents start. The most of the uh, council staffs get involved when 311, when the loop hasn't been closed with them or the the solution hasn't, the issue hasn't been resolved. So it's really down the line. It's not immediately. If they contact us immediately, we always send them to the 311 app. And a lot of people, most people are really, really happy with it. So I just, I just wanted to leave you with that and, and say that I'm, I'm not critical of San Jose 311. I think it's a great, absolutely a fabulous. Awesome. Thank you, council member. And thanks, Christine, for the, and Kevin, for the reflections and really appreciate the emphasis on um, on user research, user experience. I think that, that part is really, really important. And Councilor Foley, your comments transition us perfectly to our next item, but I believe we need a roll call vote first. Foley? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Jones? Aye. Cohen? Aye. And Mahan? Aye. Okay, thank you. And we are on to our next item, which actually was printed on the agenda as item three. So Rob, do you wanna introduce our next item? Uh, just in the interest of time, I'd say let's dive right in. <laughs> great, great, is that Jerry then or who's up? It is Jerry. Jerry, welcome. I will be kicking us off and uh, and thank you council member Foley for the kind words about 311 being a great app. We think so too, and we are also committed to making it better. Um, and then we have a great team um, who is involved with that. But first off, honorable mayor, vice mayor, chair, committee members, members of the public, I'm Jerry Dreesen, the assistant CIO uh, for the city. So today we're gonna provide an update of the status of San Jose 311. We'll focus on our customer centric plans for improving services, adding future di digital services and seeking input to self help set priorities. So just to, uh, to uh, uh, remind folks of the journey we've been on, uh, at the June 3rd Smart Cities Service Improvement Committee meeting, uh, we, we came forth with a proposed roadmap for adding services to SJ3 and 1 uh, that was discussed at that meeting. The mayor and committee members at that time requested that staff return to the September Smart Cities Service Improvements Committee with data that reflected the voice of the customer, as well as a queue of potential new services for the, for the committee to have input on. We will start a presentation today with an overview of the progress made on SJ3 and 1 since its launch in July 2017, and in particular, the progress we've seen over the last 20 months. We will discuss our current efforts to modify the underlying SJ3 and 1 technology so we can add new services at a faster pace and lower costs. We will also discuss efforts to improve service delivery response, customer satisfaction, and accessibility of SJ3 and 1. The majority of our focus today will be on metrics and a qualitative analysis surrounding what services should be considered to add next to SJ3 and 1. So what progress have we made over the last 18 to 20 months? February of 2020, uh, non-emergency non city service related calls were transitioned from the city's 911 public safety answering point to 311. In March of 2020, the city rebranded what was then My San Jose um, to what is now known as San Jose 311 to align 311 as a central engagement tool for city services. In March of 2020, the city also led the founding of National 311 Day that uh, falls on March 11th of every year. April 23rd, the city with our partners, AST and Oracle, completed a replatforming of the San Jose 311 mobile app and web portal to improve the accuracy security of the platform. 
In November 2020, the city implemented cutting edge machine learning technology into SJ3 and 1 to dynamically and automatically translate Vietnamese and Spanish with high rates of accuracy. So this means that if a Spanish speaker calls in uh, or um, uh, uses the app, uh, they, they can submit their ticket in Spanish, it, it translates to English, so we receive it and, and can service the ticket. And then after we service, service the ticket and the feedback loops are occurring in the natural language, same with Vietnamese. So it's, that's what we mean by the term dynamic. And then in, uh, in December of 2020, the city launched a voice virtual agent for residents to self-service request by voice. And in March 2021, the city address uh, added the first major new service to the mobile app and web portal since the launch of My San Jose in 2017. The residential uh, garbage and recycling service functionality was added to provide service for an estimated 12 to 15,000 service requests received um, by service providers each month. In April 2021, the city also launched an assessment aimed at improving ac accessibility across all of our SJ311 channels. Improvements of SJ311 usability, functionality, and additional services reflect in SJ311 performance metrics. Beginning in July 2017, when the SJ311 mobile app and web portal were launched, the number of reports stalled around 165,000 annually from about 39,000 active users. Reports for fiscal year 2021 are now at 181,000 from 50,000 active users. Customer satisfaction ratings improved significantly uh, with the changes um, and increased use by, by the community. In 2021, 68% of SJ3-in-1 users reported good to excellent experience versus 28% reporting good to excellent in 2020. So I'm now going to turn it to Herman to discuss our focus areas on, uh, on improving our service response and how we coordinate with all the service owners. He's also going to talk about what we've done to improve those customer satisfaction scores at a, at a deeper level. He's going to talk about our work on equity um, and our work on accessibility and plans for scaling additional services in the future. Armand? Hey, Jerry. Uh, council Chair, City Major, uh, Council Members, and uh, public in general. My name is Herman Sedano. I am the Project and Product Manager of San Jose T11. What, the, what you see here is uh, a, a metric that represents the number of tickets that they were served within the committed uh, target time. This is information that we use in a monthly basis with the service owners, where we uh, identify process improvements or application changes that are gonna help the, the customers to be served better. Those, um, those results, uh, as, as you can see, can be correlated to the increase in customer satisfaction that we have seen from, from last year. Uh, next one, please. The customer satisfaction scores. We have an average of 7%, 7.3% of residents that after they have a ticket close, they get the ability to submit a survey. Uh, when we gather those results, uh, those are the metrics that you can see here in a pie chart. Uh, as Jerry said previously, uh, the numbers have changed drastically. Uh, we had a 30% good and excellent. Last year, this year, we are in the office. We actually have seven, almost 70%. Uh, overall, the uh, customer satisfaction has increased in all departments. And, and uh, when we look into this, try to identify what will be the major reason for that, uh, we have some of them that uh, rank on the top. Uh, number one, in the last say, 16 months, uh, due to some uh, re-architecturing, as it was mentioned before, uh, we have had a, a more stable platform. Uh, number two, a better user experience and UI improvements. Uh, thanks to the funding that this, uh, this consult group provided to us, uh, we made some enhancements on the app, and we also have a, a resource that uh, focus her work about making the uh, the new app, the new service, uh, with a better UX experience. Uh, another thing that we have done, and also was mentioned previously, is an improved escalation turnaround time. 
when a resident has an issue and finds that either the ticket is not served or finds another problem, uh, we get notified, and we means the San Jose Dream One team. Uh, we work with the service delivery team or with our, our vendor, and we respond to those requests. Uh, we believe that those are the primary reasons why we see an, an, an improvement in the customer satisfaction score. Uh, you can go to the next, please. Uh, we certainly have heard uh, about the, um, the equity project. Uh, I, I'm not going to add much to it other than say that the thanks, Modi team, uh, you help us to see uh, San Jose 311 data from a different angle. Uh, and uh, as also was mentioned, not only the project, but actually uh, uh, this is a process that has been put in place that can help uh, the service owners and the San Jose 311 to measure our performance against a new metric. And that new metric is uh, equity. You wanna move to the next one, please? The accessibility project. We, um, what we have here listed are the accessibility uh, guiding principles that we use for a project that we recently, recently complete. The project was about accessibility assessment. Uh, we look into San Jose 311 uh, on, the, on the web, on the mobile, uh, that includes also the, the call center, and identify a list of uh, recommendations that we, th we think will improve the user experience uh, for people with disabilities. Of course, if we check about why this is important, the disabled community is large. At this moment, uh, based on census uh, data, 26% of adults have some level of disability. If you increase the age 75 uh, and older, that number goes to 50%. So certainly this is an important metric, an important reason for us to work on this. Uh, what is next on this effort? Uh, we are working on coming up with a roadmap so that we can um, that we can put those enhancements, those recommendations uh, to work in order to, as we said, to increase the user experience of our people with disability. Uh, all of these lessons learned apply to the omni-channel. Uh, next, please. Uh, these are some of the key lessons learned. Certainly there were, uh, there were several of them. Uh, I wanna highlight three of them. Uh, the number one is that the our decisions when we talk about the San Jose 301 should be made with the people with disability and not for them. Another thing that we wanna, um, that we learned was that the, uh, the importance of prioritizing web accessibility in procurement and contract decisions, basically right, right from the beginning. And number three, uh, the importance of building strong relationships with community organizations. Uh, what is that we see next here? Uh, basically, continue to partner with key departments in the city that were very helpful with this project. I wanna list some of them. City managers, communication office, the web governance committee, the office of racial equity and community advocates. All of them were uh, very instrumental in getting us to the completion of this project. Next one, please. What what we've been shared here is a Gardner's um, business or service model. Basically, it has three different areas, as you can see. Run, uh, run means maintain current business capabilities. Uh, grow, expand the existing capabilities. What you have, you can expand those. And number three, transformation. That's when you do the innovation part of it. And if you remember the uh, slide number two or the earlier slide that Jerry mentioned, the number of events aligned with that. I just gonna touch some of them. When we talk about the uh, maintaining capabilities, uh, we did increase the platform security and stability. That was done on that phase. And also we moved to a more scalable platform. That's why we were able to add the residential garbage and recycle uh, new service. Grow, expand the capabilities. Uh, deploy the Recycle Plus. Number two, 
we executed a proof of concept exercise that had completed last, uh, last week, where we are looking into a, a tool that will allow us to, um, to have a faster uh, developing uh, capabilities. Now, when we move to the transformation phase, now we have uh, three elements to count. Number one is we want to be able to deploy new services with a faster time to market. There are a number of, of uh, candidates. Uh, we will look more into this uh, in the next slides. But there is a number of services that uh, we want to be added or have been requested to be added. With this new development platform, we should be able to do that. And the other one is, of course, deploy at a reduced cost for the CD. A third, uh, very important as well, we will be able to bring uh, some of the development in-house, something that we haven't done in the past. So with this slide, uh, I have uh, covered our plans to expand San Jose 311 team, uh, San Jose 311 services. Uh, next, uh, we will explain our data-driven approach to identify those, two, those new uh, San Jose 311 services. I'm going to pass the control to Matt Opson now. Thank you, Herman. Good afternoon, Chairman, Honorable Mayor, committee members, and the public. My name is Matt Opsel. I'm a senior executive analyst in the city manager's Office of Communications, focused on web administration and digital content. This slide is titled 2021 Website Analytics, Half Year Quarter One and Quarter Two. In finding the voice of the customer from an omni-channel data perspective, we wanted to take a step back and also look at the digital front door for the city of San Jose, the city website. The analytics on this slide represent the half year from January to the end of June 2021. Visits have gone up 8% over the previous period to 3, 3 million visits. While more visitors have come to the city's website, we see the amount of page views or number of times pages have been viewed has gone down 4% to 7 million page views. And mobile visits are down 4% with 37% of all visits coming from visitors on mobile devices. We also see a slight drop in the amount of traffic going to the top 10 pages on the city website, down 5% to 55% of all traffic. But why are the top 10 pages important? With 55% of all traffic, the top 10 pages on the city website provide a strong snapshot of what services and information visitors are looking for on the city of San Jose website. In the first half of 2021, several pages have moved up the top 10 list, notably Adopt a Dog, Browse City Jobs, Departments and Offices, which houses contact information for departments and offices, and the Adopt a Cat page. Some pages have also dropped down lower on the top 10 list, notably the Emergency Notifications page, where we provide COVID-19 updates and flash reports, the Junk Pickup page, and the Utility Services Lookup page. It is worth noting, again, that the residential garbage and recycling services, including junk pickup and collection schedules, were launched on the San Jose 311 platform in March of 2021. The two sections on the right of this slide contain information as an update on the continued focus for our COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery messaging through weekly flash report emails and updates on the emergency notification and virtual local assistance center, or VLAC pages, available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, as well as updates for the resident assistant chatbot fed by the San Jose 311 list of frequently asked questions or FAQs. The resident assistant chatbot is where we will focus next. Next slide, please, Jerry. Thank you. This slide is titled resident assistant chatbot and contains data from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. With the amazing work and support from the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation or MODI, we launched the Resident Assistant Chatbot on the city website in July of 2020 to help residents find information faster and in a user-friendly manner. The chatbot is available in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. In its initial year from July 2020 through June of 2021, there were close to 71,000 uses of the chatbot. Users can interact with the chatbot using specific terms or using natural language to connect with an answer from one of over 580 questions found in the San Jose 311 FAQ list. We are happy to report that the chatbot has an 82% success rate in connecting users with the correct answer, and we routinely audit feedback from users to help improve the chatbot. In the initial year, ending in, ending in June of 2021, the chatbot saw 40% of its usage centered around 10 questions. 
In fact, the top two questions represent 52% of that top 10 usage, or 20% of overall usage of the chatbot. The top two questions for the chatbot are bulk pickup and contact department. Four of the top 10 questions are related to residential garbage and recycling. Notable questions in this list also include pet adoption program, tax breaks for small businesses, building permits, and utility bills. The usage patterns and feedback received from users on the chatbot provide data points that can be used to further understand the voice of the customer and help inform potential new service offerings for the San Jose 311 platform. I'd like to now hand it over to Kia to showcase additional data points in the omni-channel perspective. Kia? Great. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everybody. My name is Kia O'Hara, and I'm the manager for the San Jose 311 Customer Contact Center. Uh, before we continue to look at even more data, I would like to recognize some of our partners. Um, so we've been meeting with the Oracle AST team so that they can understand our needs and provide feedback and direction for reporting tools and the breaking down of this data. Also listed here, you'll see um, we have the Modi team, which we've been actively working with, and um, they've also been working with other service providers to come up with our equity objective, which was mentioned earlier and presented by Christine, as well as Herman. Another one of our partners, Dale, has worked with our data and provided some meaningful insight that is useful for decision making and understanding the customer's voice. Um, we've also met with Code for San Jose several times, and um, what they've done is help us to improve the customer's journey, mainly through our phone tree, but also through the SJ311 platform. Okay, and um, we can go to the next slide. On this next slide, uh, we would like to highlight two of our amazing partners, our interns, Patty and Kevin. Uh, Patricia Patty Way has been instrumental in our equity and accessibility workshops. She's worked with our community partners mentioned earlier to ensure that we intentionally design our channels with the customer in mind. Our other amazing intern here is Kevin Wang. He has been using his skills and knowledge to help produce the new categories listed for our agents that use the SJ311 platform, as well as improvements to our web chat. Um, before moving on, I just wanna say a great big thank you as we couldn't have begun to understand the voice of the customer without them. Finally, Another partner that's not listed here is our customer. Um, we will continue to work with our customers, constituents, and all those that live, work, and play in San Jose to improve upon these findings in the future. So now we can go on to some more data. <laughs> At our last Smart Cities meeting, we were questioned about the other issues category, and we heard you. The other issues category made up a majority of our incoming requests, 70,000 of them. Uh, we can go to slide 16, please. Now we're gonna take a deeper, deeper dive into what those other issues represented. Okay, so here we have our other issues listed. Please note that this is only about one month of data from July 8th through August 3rd, but we will continue to gather data and adjust our response accordingly. These other issues represent about 5,000 calls that came into the customer contact center. We take about 41% of other issue calls related to recycling and garbage inquiries, followed by 15% of water inquiries. So water inquiries include starting and stopping of water services, meter read requests, and billing questions. After this, we see 13% are directory services. Directory services would be similar to um, one of the ones that Matt just listed um, called contact department on the main website. Um, these questions are types of questions like hours of operations, addresses and telephone numbers for different departments, and usually a request to be transferred to those departments. Then we come to an interesting category, other. So although other makes up 12% of these requests, each other item is only 1% or less within that category. So an example of what other is now inclus including is questions about music in the park, um, the phone number for VTA, or questions like, are we hiring? We haven't found that these questions need their own separate category yet, but if in the future we um, see that we get an increased amount of these type of questions for specific areas like music in the park, based on you know when music in the park does come back, then we do have the ability to separate them out and use that data for um, decision-making in the future. 
The next category we see here is non-emergency police. So again, I just want to remind you that this represents the non-emergency police calls that are coming to a live agent in the call center specifically. Because on the next slide, 18, please, we have a combined list of contacts for services that are not currently in SJ311. So it's important to realize that that's the title of this slide because um, some of the other items that we do get a lot of requests about like recycling and garbage, they're already in SJ311. So they're not gonna be represented here the same way. Also, this is a monthly average of questions that comes through the contact center. It also comes through chatbot top 10, which was discussed earlier by Matt and different hotlines like illegal fireworks hotline, parks concerns hotlines, as well as online forms. So now back to non-emergency police again, this does not represent the same information that was on the previous slide. The previous slide was the, were those that were specific to the call center. These ones, um, it shows that the average is about 3000 per month. But these calls that are listed here are actually handled by our phone tree. What this means is that someone calls and prior to speaking to a live representative, the caller chose a more proper option to get them to the non-emergency police. And this would be for items such as crimes not happening at the time of the call. Next, we have directory services again, which we also saw in the previous slide and we saw in the results from the chat bot discussed by Matt. Then water inquiries again, other as already discussed. Now we come to business tax certificates and building permits. As you can see, a large portion of these averages are from forms through those departments. Um, next, we have illegal fireworks and so on. We can go to 19, please. Finally, what we've been waiting for, the top list of the contenders to be added to SJ311 next based on the data and the ability to respond, which is really important. We did not include um, business tax certificates and building permits um, because they do already have systems in place to handle their incoming forms. So although on the previous slide, they did have a large portion, um, those forms are already going through the more proper department. There are others also not listed in this initial list as we think a live response is needed, such as non-emergency police requests, utility billing inquiries, but the top three are directory services, illegal fireworks, and water inquiries. Below this, you can see that we have plans to extend this list based on the weighted shorted, shortest job first exercise that was completed just last week, as well as the library's community conversations. These ongoing community conversations will provide us more feedback to continue to listen to the voice of our customers. Um, now I'm going to pass it back to Jerry because he's going to talk about going beyond the data. Thank you, Kia. So we're continuing to focus on racial equity, inclusion, and underserved communities. As part of that work, um, all, all the services considered for addition to SJ3 and 1 will incorporate the racial equity uh, lens that's that's been patterned off the work done with the Office of Racial Equity in developing the city roadmap and also the community and economic recovery budget. The weighted shortest job first exercise used to prioritize next services that was just done last week um, also included a racial equity lens. So when I say racial equity lens, um, what does that mean? So questions are actually included in the weighted shortest job first exercise that include how equitable is the initiative? Who is benefiting? Who is burdened? What neighborhoods are we talking about? Is this serving marginalized communities? Does it serve a high risk population? What is the risk within certain neighborhoods? What is the current community impact, especially on marginalized communities if we don't complete it. In addition to that racial equity lens, we also asked, um, uh, we had data scientists from Dell Technologies who provided pro bono work um, to come in and analyze the free text comments in the service request, particularly in the category of other issues which accounts for 33% of all SJ301 service requests. The most prevalent theme found in Dell's analysis was people of different means need different things from SJ311. Livability concerns or complaint driven um, requests are more likely to be reported and at higher rates in areas with lower household incomes. 
As the city considers what services to add next to SJ 3 and one a strong consideration should be given to addressing basic opportunity and access needs. Um, examples, uh, equity and education access, affordable housing opportunities, internet connectivity, and the like for areas of lower income in parallel with efforts to address blight issues and complaint uh, driven uh, issues. So taking into consideration the data and the racial equity considerations, staff are recommending that the top five services for consideration to add to SJ3 and one include digital equity uh, slash community Wi-Fi reporting, paying a utility bill, um, and this is uh, water in, in multifamily and, and garbage, water increase such as start stop services and usage, reporting illegal fireworks, and then affordable housing services, which we could uh, consolidate to include rental assistance features and connecting tenants to affordable housing. So a discussion question we have for the committee today, perhaps after the public comments, is how do these priorities match what you hear uh, from your constituents? So at this time, I think we will conclude the presentation and open it up for discussion. Right, thank you, Jerry, I appreciate that. Thanks to Kia, Herman, and uh, Matt as well. Appreciate seeing that breakdown of other. That was a helpful uh, follow-up to our last meeting. Also, in case it was missed, I just wanna, again, recognize the fact that you all working together completely inverted that customer satisfaction score with an over 30% uh, percentage point improvement. So that's really something to celebrate. And, just, you know, congratulations and great work on that. Okay, let's go over to public comment before we discuss, and I believe we're starting with Tessa. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I did use the 311, and I was impressed when I was able, well, you know, that they, I love that they, you get in a case number and I did get response back. However, I was reporting at, at one time um, about um, the the light in our in our neighborhood, the two uh, intersections at Stockton and Taylor and Stockton and Lenzen, where one person died in Stockton and Lenzen, and my husband got hit on in a car. So what the problem is that there's no left hand turn signal to separate the oncoming traffic to from the pedestrians. And so I reported that, and then I got a, a report back that said, well, we're not working anymore. You know, we're on COVID and. We're not doing anything with the transportation. So that was very, very disappointing. And so, uh, and I didn't really understand why that would have to be, but uh, getting on to um, other issues that I think are very critical is the issues of, of safety on our streets and that we need to have a, a um, on in our 311, it should have where the problems are of our um, transportation network in terms of you know citing those problems and having them addressed. And so, you know, even that issue that I report that we need a left-hand turn signal, which I've been dealing with since my husband got hit on, in, on his bicycle, you know, that it's, it's, you know, there's no record of those things. They just go into some basket somewhere. I've been also reporting that Stockton Avenue, you know, we have a problem with, um, we need to fix Stockton Avenue in regards to the speeding and the wide openness. And that needs to be documented and, and put in some kind of uh, database like 311 where we have, you know, how we're going to be addressing those issues, you know, that everything gets a case number, you know, and so it's not, you know, being ignored. And so that that's one issue. And then even I was thinking about technology in general, there's a problem with the website for the, um, uh, what is it, the, anyway, the commission, the charter commission, Thank you. where do you report that? Thank you, Tessa. Okay, we're on to Blair. All right, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. If uh, the final uh, public comment on my previous public comment got cut off, uh, just a helpful reminder that, you know, um, with all the A&I stuff you'll be doing this fall, I hope the A&I people will be considering, you know, the, the good open democratic practices and uh, committee and council items that are on our agendas at this time. I think it can be an interesting fall to practice good open democracy with those AI things. Uh, they need that sort of help at this time, uh, and human humanistic ideas too. Um, for this item, a thank you to, uh, you know, that 311 is a really interesting concept and it started, it, you know, you guys were doing really good studies on this stuff 
uh, you know, pre-COVID-19. Uh, so when the George Floyd things came in, you guys were really prepared for these things. And it was, you know, there's several items that you've been really prepared with uh, before COVID arrived. And so thank you for that. Uh, thank you that you're making the attempt to not go crazy with law enforcement with 311. And, uh, you know, the fireworks ordinance stuff uh, hopefully can be kind of a limit for yourselves. Your other items are very interesting and helpful. I hope you can continue those sort of good efforts and that we are starting to consider, you know, reimagine in terms of, uh, I don't know, good community practices. Uh, I know reimagine can be a bunch of things, but if we keep it out of the law enforcement with 311 issues, it can develop a, a sense of trust. That could be really interesting. And I thank you guys for, uh, if you can keep up those good efforts. And um, I guess that's about all for this item. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Paul? Uh, the topic is uh, uh, digitizing the way that the city responds to the community's needs. So I'm going to keep it there. Um, you 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 have completely set in motion and in place the infrastructure to incrementally over time because these things don't like to happen like real quick they have to be incremental change you know the the frog inside the hot water doesn't know that it's boiling because it's turned up real slow so this is going to be done incrementally but ultimately the dehumanization that's going on in this city by you equating a human being with data points and thinking that the majesty, that the awesome creation can be relegated and subjugated to a data point. And that if you just find the right formula, you know that tree leaf, just a tree leaf, is far more computing capacity and power than the most powerful computer AI, Google whatever event. Why? Because it naturally convert what is in its atmosphere and to oxygen. So what it does is it sustains life. It supports life. It doesn't dehumanize it. Okay? Direction that we're going. Jean and I were on the same meeting both of us and what she stated was i see what's happened here and i'm talking about the senora that brings the uh the uh, uh the redlining map and she said the only sense of gratitude that i feel is the fact that i'm not going to be around to see happen in my city and she goes i'm grateful for that i share that sentiment thank you molly Good afternoon. My name is Molly McLeod, and I want to um, express my uh, how much I really loved talking with Patricia Way um, intern this summer on the SJ311 um, project, a uh, Stanford student, and her enthusiasm was infectious. I also appreciate on the um, Mayor's Office of Technology and um, Innovation. I'm watching a two minute video on accessibility present presentations. I see that, you know, those types of things can make a big difference. The, uh, the easier stuff, the bigger stuff would be accessible procurement policies. San Jose needs one. Um, and it's important to find out, um, you know, for the companies that are being hired, what their product is it accessible and also <laughs> Um, if it, in the areas that it's not accessible, what's going to be done about that? Um, one of the areas that was improved for uh, SJ311 was security, the CAPTCHAs, but they can be a, a barrier for people with disabilities um, who, have, uh, who are blind or, or low vision. One of the people who was featured and who did user testing voluntarily is Christine Fitzgerald from the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, a staff person who's been very generous with her time and expertise. Um, but she can't use SJ311 um, as a disabled person uh, to report potholes, which is really important when you're a power chair user, power wheelchair user. So um, making sure that you connect it back to the real stories that are at the heart of this and that those 
um, barriers are removed and improved. Part of that is also the recruitment of the people who are working on this. Make sure that the communications are accessible. I'm seeing um, advertisements for current positions where the contrast isn't um, doesn't meet minimum standards. So that sends a message for us as well, and we can do better. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Okay, we're coming back to the committee, and we will start with Council Member Foley. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Jerry, for the presentation on SJ311. I guess I was a little premature in my last comment, so I won't echo what I said last time, but I truly appreciate the focus on accessibility and inclusivity, and I'm just glad to see Molly McLeod here because she often, and I'm probably going to misquote her, she'll say uh, nothing about us without us. So your Matt, your desire and outreach to include members of the disabled community is really important in making sure that we get this right as far as San Jose 311 is concerned. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you so much. Um, but I want to talk about uh, a couple of things. And that is when a ticket is filed and then it's closed. And I've raised this before, and I just want to continue to raise it until we don't have this issue anymore or until Jerry or someone tells me that this is what we're doing. When a ticket is closed, sometimes it hasn't been resolved. In other words, the abandoned vehicle hasn't been removed, but the ticket is closed. Or we can't do what we, uh, what they want it, what the resident wants us to do, and we've closed it anyway. So the problem becomes where a ticket is closed, the resident reporting it doesn't know why it's closed or what was done. So I've raised this before. How are we approaching that in San Jose 311 in a follow up mechanism? So, uh, council member, I can start and I'm going to hand it to our service owners uh, from uh, Department of Transportation, Laura Wells. Um, but I think I think you hit on it there. It, it, it's about kind of the expectation set when you and I have brought this up before when you put something in a mobile app, people expect expect immediate action, right? And so, um, and I've used the analogy of would I use Amazon anymore if, if the box didn't show up, right? So, um, I think that's the same way it is with these services. Um, when it comes to abandoned vehicles, I, I think there has been um, kind of a service expectation that if I take a picture of a car or, or if I call in um, to the hotline, then um, uh, that abandoned vehicle will be addressed. And I think what DOT has found out is there there are implications beyond that, and there are deeper data dives uh, that need to be done on abandoned vehicles, um, and maybe the service response um, uh, needs some different design considerations. And I know they've worked hard on that, and so I'll kick it to them to talk about that. Thank you, Laura. Yes. Or... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry and, and Councilmember Foley. Um, Got two things that that we need to focus on. One is um, communicating and communicating, communicating um, in many different forums, so that we can describe what an abandoned vehicle is. Um, what we found um, with the program pre-COVID was that the vast majority of, of residents who were submitting concerns through 311 were doing so for vehicles that were not abandoned. They were nuisance vehicles. They were vehicles that were parked in their neighborhood that they just didn't want it there. And, and so with that program pre-COVID, um, only about 7% of the vehicles were either meeting the state's criteria for, for being inoperable or they were abandoned. The other 93%, we were essentially just moving the vehicles around the city. Or when we went out there the first time, the vehicle wasn't there. Um, what we found um, when we modified the program during COVID, and we began by proactively driving every street in the city and, and doing that a couple times a month. And we were finding vehicles 
a significant number of vehicles that were not being and are not being reported to 311. We, we complemented that with then triaging all requests that were coming into 311 and looking at each of you know photos that are were being submitted and identifying those vehicles that had indicators that they might be abandoned. And so then we would also you know go out and investigate those vehicles and from the pre-COVID where we had we're towing maybe seven percent of the vehicles, we're now towing 25 to 30% of the vehicles. And very importantly, the um, as, we, as we shared with council during the budget study sessions on, on um, budgeting for equity, um, a high concentration of the vehicles that are not being reported are in low income areas. And a high percentage of, of the vehicles that are being towed through this program, this, this modified hybrid approach, um, are, are ones that, that are not being reported in those low income areas. Um, we know in, in looking at the data that Herman discussed and, and, and Jerry discussed that um, the residents who are providing the ratings of, you did poorly, you know, they're not favorable ratings. Um, the majority that the majority of those residents are giving those ratings because one nothing happened and two they don't know why the case was closed and so we need to better get out information on what is considered an abandoned vehicle and we've done that um, the 311 platform was was through itd just modified this week so that before even filing a filing a request the resident is provided with clear information on here's what an abandoned vehicle is. Here's what a, an extreme blighted vehicle is. And they have that. And then we invite them to um, include photos. Um, the, the platform now requires the photos to be submitted to help us to better identify those vehicles that might be abandoned. Um, so I know that's a long, a long explanation. I don't know if it fully answered your, your question, Council Member Foley. Uh, thank you for the explanation, but not really. Okay, um, sorry. I, I understand the level of abandoned vehicles yeah. that you're getting reported and, and what you're doing to address that. And that's one issue. That's actually not the issue I was asking okay, about, but, but thank you about that. What I'm really asking about is that when someone reports, and I'm just picking abandoned vehicles, it mm -hmm. could be illegal dumping, it could be you know anything. They don't know how there's the, the ticket was closed, the case is closed, but they don't know how it was resolved. They're not getting feedback that says we didn't tow this car because X Y Z occurred. That's what I think needs to happen right. because they see this vehicle that in their minds is abandoned, that no one's moved it in three weeks. Uh, it looks broken down. Uh, you know, how do they tell? I don't know. Maybe it's got yeah. oil leaking underneath, whatever, the, whatever. Maybe it's even stolen for that, for that yeah. matter. Right. And, and so they report it. They go through the app, San Jose 311, they report it, they take the picture, they do everything they're supposed to, and then they get a message back closed. Car is still there. They don't know why the car is still there. So mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting is, uh, and, and maybe more than suggesting, is hoping that we will resolve this and we'll be able to give them the feedback that they need to know why the car wasn't, right. Right. wasn't uh, moved or uh, what, why their case was closed with no resolution in their mind. I mean, that's what it's, you're right. It is all about communications and we communicate, we have to manage expectations. And I know the level of abandoned vehicles is huge throughout the city, particularly since uh, under COVID we were delaying, uh, dealing with addressing ban abandoned vehicles in the first few months anyway. But it's really about closing the loop with the resident, the customer, what have we done to resolve the issue or why didn't we resolve the and, issue? And Councilmember Foley, that is an excellent um, um, 
comment and, and observation. And, um, you know, Vince um, on the earlier presentation mentioned our um, community Salesforce platform. Um, vehicle abatement, um, the abandoned vehicle program is extremely complex. Um, we have integrated San Jose 311 with our Unity Salesforce platform, and we are providing a more robust communication um, responses to customers. Um, and, and in fact, if I can just read you, read you one, um, that um, we, we frequently test, test the system. It's, um, um, I'll call our program manager, hi Heather. We closed your abandoned vehicle report at a certain location. Um, and then it says, why? Thank you for your vehicle abatement request. You visited or returned to the location described in your request and either did not find the vehicle there, um, at, I'm sorry, and did not find the vehicle there. Your request has been closed. So they are getting a, um, a closure report from the 311 platform, but it's also combined with more information from our Unity Salesforce platform. And for the ones that are tagged, and then we do a follow-up, they can open up their case and see the whole history of what we've done on that vehicle and the communication that they have received on that vehicle. Um, it might be that they're not opening up the full report and they're just seeing we close your case and, and getting frustrated. So we clearly need to do a better job of, of figuring out how to make sure that we see all of the information. Thank you, and that's great information to know that there is some follow-up. Is that automatic then, that when a case is closed, we're automatically sending a follow-up uh, email? And is, it, is it from staff-driven, or it's all uh, electronic delivered as a response? It's, it's staff-driven. They okay. get an email response based upon the um, the process that's being followed with the case, either it's been tagged um, or closed or, um, or towed, they will get that information. And so it's generated by staff, but it's automated through the system. Okay, cool. All right, thank you, I appreciate thank you. it. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Foley. And I, I know we're about to lose the Vice Mayor to his VTA meeting. So do you wanna jump in Vice Mayor Jones? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I'll make it real quick. Um, you know, looking at the slide, trying to think about the answer to um, to the question, and it really goes back to uh, Councilmember Foley's question about abandoned vehicles. If, if I think about the top uh, three uh, complaints that I get about the app that come to my office, it's abandoned vehicles, abandoned vehicles. Abandoned vehicles. Uh, so one is, is it possible for us to get some type of data in terms of the other uh, or, or the requests that are made through the, through the app uh, for any particular request? Is, there, is, is it possible to get that by district so that I, I would have a clear understanding of, of what uh, my constituents are requesting? Because again, as far as complaints are concerned, it, it's 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 been totally about abandoned vehicles. So that's that's a request that I have. And and another statement is, I don't think it's really fair for staff and DOT the way that the process is currently set up. I don't think it's it's fair and is working for our constituents around abandoned vehicles. And so my question which I'm not gonna have enough time to even hear the answer is, does it make sense to continue to have abandoned vehicles on the app or should we suspend it or, or deactivate it until we work out the, the, the logistics or even maybe there's no way to set realistic expectations. If 93% of the requests are not gonna uh, conform to the criteria of towing the cars, then we're set up to have unreal, 
unrealistic expectations by our, by the user. So I, I guess my statement is, does it even make sense to continue to have abandoned vehicles as part of the, uh, the app? And I got to hop off, so I'm going to leave it on that note. And uh, maybe I'll watch, if you guys can answer some of those questions, I'll watch the video and, and see, hear what the answers are. But, but I smear the phone. Vice Mayor, if I could have one, so just to address the first part of that, um, sure. we actually do have um, and, and can connect with your offices on the data analytics uh, that we have in our in our portal. It's actually online and it shows all the requests by district. Uh, uh, pretty easy to break that down and we can share that with you, you and your staff. Great. Thanks, Jerry. I got to run. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank Enjoy you. that VTA meeting. Take all care. Right. All right. Uh, I have a few comments, but why don't we go to Councilmember Cohen first? Um, okay, I don't want to pile on on abandoned vehicles, but I, I'll just continue the conversation for a minute because um, obviously this is something we all get complaints about. But it, this is more about how we can get visibility to to this and about the reporting. And this isn't really about DOT's response, um, but just about the app and and the usability. Um, so, you know, as a council office, people will tell us that they have issues with abandoned vehicles. And we, you know, we can explain why it is that these, that the vehicles are not being abated and not being moved. But when there's a, when they submit to the system and, and there's been a resolution, um, you know, it, it is possible, again, Laura's explained that they get a response and I don't know what kind of response they see. We don't know as a staff, what kind of response they see. It looks like we can't necessarily see the view of the, um, submission of their request to San Jose 311 from the perspective of the customer. Um, and what, what, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is a complicated thing to implement, but what I think would be nice is as a district, as an off the council office, if we had access to submissions from our district and maybe be able to view what our customer, what our constituents are seeing so that we would be able to say, oh, here we see what you submitted and we see what you're getting back from the city. So we can more um, accurately communicate with them about what their response that they're getting, because it's hard for us to, to communicate with them about the response they're getting without actually seeing the response that they're getting. Um, it's kind of hard for us to, to communicate with them. So if there were some way for us to have that visibility into the the view that they're seeing and the response that they're getting, then we could more accurately communicate with them. So uh, from an improvement standpoint into the system, I think that would be, so at least that's what I would request, um, is being able to, to view that from their perspective. Yeah. Council member, I, uh, um, we, we can already break the data down by council district. So I, I, I wanna say uh, that I'm, I think, I think we can come up with something um, for you, uh, you and, and other council members if you want to actually um, dive deeper into um, both what we're communicating back to those residents, because um, uh, we do provide a follow-up email when they submit those. And it, it does contain the service levels um, that you saw on the gr graphic. Um, you know, we will address your vehicle within the target date and, and those sorts of things. But I think you're asking a deeper question and I think we can we can share, we can figure out a way to share that data with you, with your district. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Jerry, if I, if I can add something, if, if, if the ticket was was logged uh, as one that can is is public, right? because you have the any user have the option to say private or public. If the ticket is public, that means that anybody could be able to see it. In addition of that, uh, San Jose 311 what is has what is called a a browser user interface. At some point, some of the staff members from the from the different districts they had access to it. Uh, we, we have licenses available for that. So I can actually contact some of your department, some of your offices, and anybody who's interested in, in learning more about this uh, will give you the chance to go directly there and check the status of those tickets. Okay, maybe we need some training because my staff says they don't know how to do it. So it, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's just a matter of not being trained properly, but yeah. so we'll contact you and try to, try, to learn, try to get that training so we can get that access. Um, so that'd be great if we had that. So and then, then from a metric standpoint, I see, I mean, obviously there's two metrics. One is speed to resolution and one is the satisfaction of the customer of the resolution. And I see obviously abandoned vehicles had 
finish number one in terms of speed of resolution, um, which won't necessarily be satisfying to the customer who's not happy with the resolution. Um, but obviously speed is important. We wanna to get to things quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously we wanna keep measuring that, um, but, you know, we don't necessarily wanna say that that's a success if people, you know, if we don't necessarily have a good way of telling people why the, the, uh, the resolution wasn't, wasn't done to their satisfaction. Um, but I, I do have a question about the, the, the scale. And I think uh, Councilmember Mahan has a memo that talks about the measures. So we'll get to that a little bit later. I'll let him talk about it. But I am a little confused about the, the, the five, you know, uh, were, you know, rankings and, and how fair, if, if fair ranks higher than average, which doesn't make sense to me and some of those things. But I guess um, we'll, we'll get to that under the, the memo that Councilmember Mahan probably wants to discuss a little bit. I'll let him take it from here. Okay, thanks, Councilmember. Yeah, I was going to suggest maybe I could make speed this along by interjecting quickly. And I want to really thank my colleagues for great questions. I, I want to reemphasize to Councilmember Foley's point just how important loop closing is. I, I spent about a decade building digital tools and services for customers. And learned a lot um, very, very painfully about uh, what we thought as the, you know, as the tool providers, the people building the service, what we thought was happening was not necessarily happening or was not the, the perception on the other side. So um, really appreciate all the, all the comments. And um, I want to suggest a couple of things that hit on the memo. I'll get to the scale point Councilmember Cohen made. Um, I think, you know, the, the first is the first thing I want to suggest is not in the memo, which is that we consider and maybe at a future meeting have a, a more in-depth discussion about user testing and usability, um, user experience. There, there are a lot of best practices that are a little bit labor intensive, but, but what I've seen is that you have to actually get out of the office, go out to the customer, in this case, our residents and small business owners and, and tourists and visitors and so on, as was mentioned earlier, and watch them use the tool in real time in an organic environment as best as possible. Obviously, it's always a little bit artificial when uh, somebody's standing over your shoulder, but to actually watch someone use a service, especially a digital service, and provide you with their stream of consciousness experience is, is just incredibly enlightening. I think, and, and I know we, we, we have some familiarity within City Hall about user testing and usability research, but I just would encourage us to lean more heavily into it because we've got we've to gotta experience, truly experience the app from, through the eyes of, of our users. It's just, it's, I just can't emphasize the point enough. It's a longer conversation. I realize we're at four o'clock. So I'm just going to throw that out there and let it let it marinate for a moment. Um, the, the other thing I want to suggest is um, a framework for evaluating how we're performing. And Councilmember Cohen mentioned the two metrics. We've got a sort of a, a response time metric, which is sort of our own understanding of how quickly we're delivering the service, and presumably at a at a certain quality level. Um, and then we've got a satisfaction measure, which is sort of, okay, well, what does the customer think? And it's interesting when there's a disparity there, um, when we think we're delivering on time and at a, at a quality standard we, we believe is acceptable, and then the customer maybe does or doesn't agree. And then I want to suggest that, that we have a third metric around equity, which is, are we actually reaching, do we, do, what, what measure, and I, I don't know what that measure is, I'm suggesting in this memo that staff come back in December, so, so everybody knows in December we're going to revisit this report. We're going to get another status report on 311, talk about performance, talk about, uh, continue the conversation we're having today, talk about potential new services we might power. And so I'm just going to quickly summarize my recommendation. So one is that for those two existing metrics that Councilmember Cohen just described that are in the presentation, I'm suggesting that, that staff come back with a proposed performance target. So we have the metric, the number of hours or days that we want to deliver the service by, fulfill, you know, close the request, basically. We have the customer service measure, and I'm suggesting that staff recommend a third metric around equitable delivery of the service. 
and that we actually set a target for each one. So it's, it's, I think we, we started in the right place, which is let's, let's agree on what to measure and let's start measuring it and let's start reporting on it, which is awesome. That's foundational, critical. I think it looks like we're starting to do that really consistently, which is important. Um, but now I think it's time to add that equity measure and then for all three, propose and discuss and ultimately set a target. What, what do we think is, re where do we wanna be? What's our standard? That leads to the second recommendation, which is to say, for any services that we are, we are providing, we're, we're basically making a commitment to the customer that we're gonna, we're gonna deliver this service at the following measures of, of quality, customer satisfaction, and equitability. Um, for the ones where we're not yet hitting our target, I'd like to see a qualitative description in December of, of what we're doing to meet the target and what we think it would take. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a process change, maybe there's a budget need, but what would it take to hit our target? Because if we're gonna set goals, then we need to talk about what it would take to hit them. Um, I want a third, third recommendation, suggest that before we add new services, we at least have a discussion of what our performance targets would be against those three, those three metrics and whether or not we believe today the service owner is in a position to deliver the service at the, at the performance target that we would want to set. So let's, rather than introducing a service and then finding out, let's see if we can front load a little bit of our analysis of whether or not we're going to actually be able to fulfill that service adequately. And then finally, Councilor Cohen mentioned this. My fourth recommendation is about balancing the scale so that it is symmetric. We currently have two items that are pretty similar. I would say fair and average could be interpreted to be similar. Um, and I think having a, a average or neutral midpoint and then very clearly having symmetry around two, uh, two options that are above average and two that are below and that they're proportional. So very satisfied, very unsatisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat unsatisfied, you know, moderate or average or neut neutrally satisfied. So I think just getting that clear symmetry is going to, uh, I think, make the data quality, uh, it's going to improve data quality and make this a more useful measure. So that, that's just a summary of the recommendations. I guess I'd love to hear feedback from colleagues and or um, staff on those points. And sorry, thank you for your patience and me kind of outlining those. Um, do, do we, Mayor, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to offer, look, I, I, I agree with uh, all of the points you've just made in that memorandum, um, Chair, Mr. Chair, but I, I think there's one disclaimer I'd want to offer, which is in the past, we've been pretty adamant that we don't expand services until we're certain that we can deliver. Um, and I, I've heard that explanation several times before for why 311 is not expanding. And obviously there are other bigger challenges I know too, just in terms of being able to, the, the capacity and software build out and back end. And I realize it's a lot of work, but I just heard that a lot. I think it would be a mistake for us to say, we've got to be sure before we can jump, because this is a really important tool to help us gather data about what people are concerned about. Though certainly an imperfect tool. We all know that uh, you're going to hear you're going to see people more engaged on west side than east side. So we, we need to be very mindful of those disparities. But this is a tool. And I would hate to think we're not going to come out with services because we're not certain we can do it super well. Um, I, I think this is an important tool to help us learn as an organization as well. And so I'd hate to see us on a slower path uh, because of some risk aversion on that, on that point. I think that's a great point, and I actually am happy to incorporate that into the spirit of the memo. I, what I think I'd like to argue for is that when we add a new service, we come in eyes wide open with at least a description of our, our belief as to how well we can provide it. And if we then decide that, hey, our fulfillment on this is likely to be low, but we think the data gathering utility outweighs the fulfillment target goal, you know, that, that, that's, that we just make that decision consciously. I don't think it necessarily needs to be a barrier. I would, I would argue that with the proper disclaimers, we could have a service that where we maybe under deliver on fulfillment, but if we set the right expectations with the public that, hey, we're gathering data, if we're very transparent with the public, they might even appreciate and understand why we weren't able to actually stop those fireworks from going off, for example. So I'm, I'm very open to that. I just, 
I think we ought to have a framework around having goals and knowing where we are against the goals. Agreed. And then we may, we may decide to, you know, include and, uh, and, and offer a service where we're not, we're, we're consciously not at the goal for some other reason. I think that's okay. Chair. Yeah, agreed. Thanks. Okay. Chair, may I jump into sure, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. just in reaction to that, you, you know, a year ago, if you would ask me technically, are we confident from a technical perspective, are we ready to add services? I would have had to say, I'm not sure. I don't, I, I don't think so. We had 20% of our data that were resulting in uh, data synchronization issues between the apps we integrate with, um, like Salesforce and App Order, um, where some of those service requests were um, uh, having to be manually checked um, by some of the departments. So there, there were technical problems. We also had a bot um, that uh, that was created that was actually generating uh, six to eight thousand false reports per month um, from a single user. And so we've addressed those technical things now. And so and 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 now we're working um, to, for. Um, to make the, the technical platform scalable, which means, um, you know, what used to cost us uh, um, uh, upwards of 100,000 per service um, and took us six to eight months, um, we're building towards being able to turn out an app in six to eight weeks with $20,000 um, marked reduction, right? And so, um, and I, you know, you saw the the services that we're actually saying for consideration in the future, um, you'd, uh, reporting community Wi-Fi, some water issues, which are going to be very pertinent now that uh, if the moratorium comes up on on um, uh, on uh, um, public utility billing, and 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 uh, there are a lot of people who are behind, and uh, um, we we consider a big backlog. Maybe three one one can help, and then of course fireworks as well. And so, I think there are some. Maybe we can do both, Chair, um, and I'm not sure how you want to have that conversation, but uh, certainly agree with uh, tightening up the metrics and service delivery, um, and and uh, maybe we can do both is uh, add a couple and and test the metrics at the same time if you're open to that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I, I hope my memo is not interpreted as saying let's not add new services. I, I what, what I'm what I am advocating for is that. When we have a service, we at least set a performance target and we're just really clear with ourselves about whether or not we're meeting it. And then we can have an, an honest conversation about whether or not that's a problem. And if we say, well, we're not, meeting, we're not meeting our target right now, but that's okay because we simply, we simply can't resource it more and that's what would be required. And so we're gonna have to wait until tax revenue gets go up or that's okay because we're collecting valuable data and we think we're setting appropriate expectations with the public around why we're asking them to give us this information even though we can't act on it today. That could be perfectly acceptable. I just, I, I think it's important that we set a, set a goal and are clear about, because I, I don't know how to interpret the fact that we're meeting our expected resolution time 44% of the time for streetlights. And I don't, I, you know, I think this report would be stronger if we were able to clearly see, okay, we've set a target of 50% and here's why, you know, it's just, or, or we've, we've set a target for 80% and we're only at half of that. And that is a problem, but here's what we're doing to fix it. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I think the conversation should be more explicit, I guess is what I'm saying. Otherwise, I don't know how to interpret the performance data that we do have. And I, I think the same goes for customer satisfaction. So. Um, but I, I don't think that that should be a barrier necessarily to adding new services, although there is a trade-off, right? We, we wouldn't want to add a ton of services and be under, under delivering on all of them. So I, I think we should just be explicit about that. Rob, did you want to jump in? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so the three main things I'm hearing is on follow through, uh, we do want to be intentional about some targets um, and track to those and be able to report to them and, and even uh, say why those targets are there. Um, on your recommendation, also some of the equity goals that we can weave into those services and, and how to improve in that way. That, that's along the lines of what we were thinking and planning um, anyway, so it, it, it shows good alignment. But on uh, Councilmember Cohen's ask is maybe even be more revealing and uh, provide more data access to, and, and Councilmember Foley, um, so you can see what came in uh, for what district, um, what the response was when, and then get to point number two, which is follow up, which is that communication pattern and maximizing our effectiveness and how we communicate. And we have struggled with that, to be, to be honest, because if we communicate upfront and following up, 
um, people can be okay with a reasonable, reasonably long response. And we see that with street light outages, for example, is there's a rubric there on, on how safety related the replacement is. Some replacements take weeks um, and the customer satisfaction on good to excellent is still uh, you know, much higher than, than uh, abandoned vehicles, for example. So if we communicate well, maybe we can mitigate those things. And then the third thing though, is on the service choices, if we can go to the last slide, this is where we're trying to mix the, the livability issues along with the, the equity wants um, um, so that we say these are the right services to do next. And we do want to still emphasize the services where we can give fulfillment because those are success and they drive additional usage, but it's not to preclude where we choose a, a hairy um, and, and wicked hard problem and, and try to put it in there like we did with abandoned vehicles. Uh, tra transportation was very clear up front. This is a hard one because it's not a simple um, ask and answer. There's other variables that go in here that, that complicate that response. But just to bring us back, um, and any feedback um, on the the potential services that we're looking to add um, from the committee? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Would love to hear that, uh, Councilmember Cohen, and then Mayor Lepore. That kind of was part of my question. I mean, reporting illegal fireworks is something we've been asked a lot from our residents to to make available, right? I mean, it's an important ask from people there they want to be able to have a place and outlet for that and obviously we have other means that we've offered them to do that i think it's important to integrate things into one location for, for, for a variety of reasons i mean if they've already got this app to use for other types of reports then using it for this is good but um and also if they've been if if, if reporting legal fireworks is important to them they might discover this app for other uses so it's all it's good to have people use one app but reporting illegal fireworks is a different kind of request, right? They're not necessarily going to, it's not like fixing a, a pothole or a street light because you don't have a follow-up that says done, it's fixed and check off, check off a, a box, right? I mean, the, the firework happened and you can't say, okay, we've now fixed that firework incident. Um, so there's a different kind of expectation of that report. So I, I guess I was partly wondering what, you know, whether the, the interface for that will be somewhat different um, and what what the messaging would be on that because you know it's a report more than a uh, a request for service right and and how you the feedback and the and the and the metric is different right than it is on these other kinds of things so to me that's a a good thing to put in the app for the reasons I started with but it's a different kind of request than the others um, the other ones you know if there's something related to you know, paying a bill or doing something else where they need help and there's a quick metric of checking a box and getting back to them. Um, to me, getting things into the app that are already through uh, available to people through other means is important just because you're consolidating services through one tool. Um, so I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to necessarily slow that consolidation down if we have, um, if we feel we have the bandwidth to get things consolidated into one place. If I could if I could respond to that, Chair, uh, Jerry Dreesen. Yeah, uh, yeah so um, a couple things. The weighted shortest job first exercise, it, it, it takes in uh, to consideration community value, um, urgency, but also um, the, the weighted shortest uh, job first. How hard is it to add that service? And, and so Fireworks is fourth because quite frankly, and we've said it before, there's a few things we have to work out um, before we get to that versus reporting community Wi-Fi. You know, am I getting good signal or bad signal? Adding that button into the SJ3 in one app, we don't think would be that hard. And it could be high value for people um, uh, since we have digital equity um, uh, funding on the table. It would actually show us where do we need to put our efforts to actually um, fix the bad signal problems um, that that raises up those communities where they don't have good digital access to schools. Um, I'll go back to fireworks and we have the service owners for fireworks here. We've spent a lot of time together between code enforcement, fire department, um, and, and IT in working out those process issues. And I've been pretty adamant about saying, um, please don't add it to the app until we fix some of the process issues. The social host ordinance and then also some of the work that fire and, uh, and code enforcement has done um, at the last public safety uh, and, and, and finance committee, we started to see a change um, because they, they, there was a pre-existing app for fireworks and um, it didn't have required fields. So um, it had all of 
it had a lot of junk data entered into it with no addresses that couldn't be responded to. As soon as um, the required address fields went in and some other required fields got in, the data got cleaner and it allowed Steph to do a better job of actually sending out warnings because now they have an address. If you spin that back around um, and we uh, were to put it into a more sophisticated platform um, than its current platform, um, like SJ301, we could create some automation to help code enforcement that has staffing limitations automate the, the noticing up of the warning. So it, it kind of is a circular thing. If you have a good process in place, mm -hmm. automation can help make it faster. And I think we're mm -hmm. we're getting closer to that with fireworks. And we're are we at an 80% target level yet? I'm not sure about that, but we're heading into that 60% range. So, um, and I don't know if uh, Fire, who's on the phone, want to uh, or on the the, the call here, um, want to talk about that. But we're starting to get better, and Fireworks is actually a pretty good example of um, where we've intentionally worked on the process before automating it. Oh, just just to wrap up in my comments, I I think I I agree with your methodology as far as how you're ranking the priorities. So. You know, I think that you're on a good path as far as how you're going to integrate things into the system. Great. I, I know we're going to lose the mayor fairly soon here. Do you want to jump in, Mayor Lefer? Uh Thank you. Uh, just uh, three points. One is, uh, you know, my vote would be, I know reporting legal fireworks is hard. It's hard to get that done. I think it's worth scaling that mountain, even if um, it, it does take uh, more work even if it's imperfect, because the only value of that information is the immediacy of the information. Can someone get a photo? Uh, can someone identify an address? Can someone identify a license plate? Because we know this is really, you know, everybody's chasing ghosts with these fireworks. And so it is so important for us to have an online sort of fireworks app that someone needs to go find somewhere it just undermines everything we're trying to do if we don't make it simple. So I would argue, I think it needs to be higher. I understand it's harder. I think it's still worth it. Worth it. Um, the utility bills, I just had a question. I, I Forgive me, I don't live in an area where I'm not in San Jose Muni territory. I'm in San Jose Water. So are, are those bills paid on the, on the property tax? I can answer that. Hi, Key O'Hara for SJ311. Um, for the municipal water bills, those are not. Those are paid just like you pay your San Jose water bill directly to the city of San Jose. Um, for the garbage services, single family dwelling, those are billed on property taxes unless you have an increase in the middle of the year on your garbage cart size. And we do also still take multifamily dwelling payments for garbage directly. Okay. I think it's just going to be there's gonna be a lot of work and it's gonna be confusing for people because we know 90% of our residents don't live where San Jose Muni is. Uh, and so they're gonna be trying to pay San Jose water. And I, you know, I think it's gonna be challenging. So I, my, my gut would say, I, I probably wouldn't prioritize that one as much because uh, I think it's gonna be really hard to implement uh, in a way that's gonna meaningfully make a difference. And if people are paying through the property tax anyway, again, the need for immediacy is not great, but I understand in cases of San Jose water Muni, then they are paying directly to us. So. Appreciate it. there's there's some challenging issues to work out. Last thing I just suggest is um, having a non-emergency crime reporting tool. Um, I think would be incredibly valuable um, in terms of ensuring San Jose PD has data that they need to understand what's happening where. Obviously, you know we need disclaimers that says you're not going to we're not going to be sending um, an officer to respond um, in the next. 12 hours, so don't expect that. But if you just want to report the auto burglary, um, the the broken window uh, in the commercial building down the street, whatever it might be, um, I, I can't help but think that could be really important and uh, helpful for all of us. Uh, and I think it would also address the frustration that an awful lot of folks feel because they're calling 911 and a cop's not gonna respond. Uh, so being able to get them plugged in right away to the reporting tools so they can report the burglary at their home um, without having to sit on 311 for an hour, for, you know, for whatever length of time before they are told how to do that. I just think that could be a great value. Thanks, Mayor. Does anyone from staff want to respond to any of those comments? Well, I would just offer, based on what Jerry was saying, uh, Chair, that 
we did a lot of work to refine the online reporting tool so for so that we are able to actually respond in some kind of action to every report that was submitted. So every report that was submitted was complete because we had created mandates in terms of the fields. And although I'm sure from a statistical standpoint, we would like to see more robust uh, citations and warnings sent out, all of the ones that we couldn't respond to that level, we could at least capture geographical data points that we can utilize for future enforcement efforts to hotspot mapping. So essentially, we're able to respond to everything that came through the online reporting tool in one way or another. I'm sorry, is that with regard to fireworks specifically? That is the fireworks. Yeah. And, okay, and can maybe you, this is worth an offline conversation. It, I, I think that's great. I, I just think the immediacy of having it on the same tool where you report everything else is you know, very self-evident to many of our residents. And I understand there may be challenges in integrating, but I, I just think that's so valuable. Chair, if, if the Assistant Chief can just identify himself for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, um, I'm Battalion Chief Arthur Belton. I'm functioning as the okay. Deputy Chief in Fire Prevention. And, okay. Thanks. And I'll add a couple of responses to Mayor. I think your points about water are fair. Um, and I, um, in talking to staff about what, what I kind of thought the discussion might go to today, I think the digital equity and community Wi-Fi reporting is kind of a no-brainer if it's easy and, and can provide a lot of value. I would categorize the next two bullets as something about water. I mean, to keep in mind, we we don't we haven't defined the requirements yet. Um, we do have an audit going on right now um, around uh, water, and, and we're finding some usability things that could be enhanced around um, water, um, one of which is uh, doing a better job around reporting a water leak. I, you know, I'm not sure if any of that makes sense but i do think your points about meaning water is only a portion of the uh, uh water uh in a smaller portion um i think we have to consider that i i did think that uh reporting illegal fireworks um it's almost like in parallel can start moving forward with digital equity and then housing's already in motion um they're already doing uh the doorway project and that could be as simple as linking a button into the app so um I, again, if we're scaling, if those three uh, move forward, um, along with getting better about the data reporting, I think I think we'd be in pretty good shape. Agreed. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. That sounds reasonable to me. Any other any other comments? Feedback? Okay. Well, I think. Thank everyone for um, a robust discussion. And, and Jerry, do you feel like you got enough feedback on the potential service additions there? Yes, uh, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, great. And Chair, just as a reminder, we'll be back in December based on this feedback um, and we'll respond to your memo along the way. And then that report will include um, actions on your memo as well as uh, new services based on the feedback you've uh, council or the committee has given us today. Great, and and we might either want to adopt it, or you can just take it. The discussion as feedback. I'm okay either way. I don't. I don't feel too. I certainly don't want to mandate a ton of unnecessary work. I think. I think you understand the spirit of what I'm looking for in terms of setting goals, and and adding a adding an equity metric, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, did one of my colleagues want to offer a motion to help us move through this item? Happy to move the memorandum. Great, thanks. Second. Okay, thank you. Let's do a roll call. Foley? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Rob, we are a little, little later here than we'd expected. How many minutes do you anticipate this item being? Um, I think I can move through the privacy item in about 10 minutes um, and then the questions and answering uh, um, maybe if there's um, energy left, we can answer it or we can um, defer the completion of the item to the next meeting chair. Let me ask my colleagues how they're doing with time. It's a little later than we would hope to be. Uh, so it sounds like this would be a roughly 20 minute item. Uh, Mayor, council members, I think we need at least three of us to make this work. What are your thoughts? Councilor Foley? I'm I'm here till five, but that's a hard stop. Understood. I think we could do that. Councilor Cohen. Um, I'm going to transition to the road, and I can do it on the phone, and so that works for me. 
Okay. Well then, and I know Mayor probably needs to get. I think he needs to get going. But why don't we? Uh, why don't we do the presentation? Let's see if we can get this uh, done satisfactorily in about uh, before five. All right. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Chair uh, Rob Lloyd, Chief Information Officer for the City of San Jose. Uh, the item we have in front of you now is around um, an update for privacy. And this was, um, as promised previously, the implementation of the privacy policy that was approved um, and effective in July. Uh, so we're going to talk about the operational implementation of the policy as well as some future steps that we have ahead of us. Uh, just by way of fast recap is privacy is both a technical um, and a participative item. There are some technical elements to how we secure information and make sure that we're properly locking things down and preventing misuse and misrelease of information. But we're also trying to talk with the community about what we can do with that data to improve services, to reach people better, to reach people more, and to also gauge their sentiment around how we can use their information because that is evolving. Um, after um, some, some debacles in the press about how people's information are, are used and um, that, that privacy intersects maybe um, gone over the line a few times in private sector and public sector, people's sentiments have changed over the last few years. And that's something for us to continue to uh, continually gauge and, and evolve to. Um, so we do want to say that our quest is to use information and data to, um, to do it securely and to do it in a way that fuels civic-minded data use. And we draw the line there is when it stops serving the public, uh, we no longer will do it. Um, and just for a recap, in 2018, we um, council uh, approved the privacy principles that we worked on started as an engagement with um, Harvard Cyber Law Clinic, um, assessment of other communities, seeing where technology and data use were going. Um, and that recommendation involved doing privacy principles and then also a privacy policy. And that privacy policy was approved by council in December of 2020 um, and went into effect July of 2021 for some implementation time. We do want to call out some of the sentiments from the community that we always want to be mindful of. They, uh, number one, they say they don't want data to be used in a way that uh, we turn the community into a surveil surveillance state and, and the way they said it was a, a real life minority report. Um, we do need to anonymize and give people power over their information as we decide to use it for policy and, and practice. And that um, it needs to be a programmatic approach because privacy can't happen as a sliver of other people's jobs or an, an add-on on the side. It needs to be intentional and, and mindful. People need to be trained how to do it. And those processes and controls do need to be inside the organization. I do also want to point out that in the city yes. roadmap, uh, in the city roadmap, that this is not a um, a priority um, as a, above the line. This is a backlogged item. So we do have a combination where we have an approved policy, implementation of that policy, but what we call a, a privacy light approach. We're going to uh, embed it into a number of city processes that we um, abide by that, that privacy um, uh, policy and, and people know about it and are trained to do it. But it's, it's not going to have the full weight of a large program because we have other things that we've prioritized around, uh, around COVID um, response and recovery. Um, and some some um, of the enterprise priorities that we need to focus on more. Uh, there is, uh, as I showed earlier, um, also a pairing with the surveillance ordinance um, that needs to, to be done when this does come above the line, but there's more work to be done then. So Privacy Light, we are trying to implement a process and structure that has appropriate rigor, but allows departments to still do their work. Uh, and so that means what processes we put in place as well as what standardized items we put into place to make things go faster. Um, and the rubric we're trying to teach the organization is everything that we do with data and personally identifiable information has a, a matrix of how risky is it and how useful is it. And when it's low risk and high use, we're gonna do those every day and twice on Sundays. Um, and if it's low uh, return and high risk, we're never going to do those. And we have a couple scenarios where we've already turned down those types of requests of projects uh, just because the value wasn't there. And then in the in-betweens where it's um, high risk um, and high return um, or um, low return uh, or high, uh, lower risk um, but uh, lower return, sometimes those are debatable. We'll have those discussions as we need to. 
So to show you what we uh, have in place now, there is a privacy review um, prior to procurement that we've implemented. So if anything goes through a procurement process and has data at use, uh, there is a cybersecurity review, an architectural review, and now a privacy review. Those seven elements have to be discussed and reviewed and, and uh, described in full how it's being treated um, for that procurement to actually go forward and will not go forward without that. We also have now a standard contract language credit to um, the purchasing division for, for coming up with this model, where we have some standard language around privacy and responsibilities of vendors for the use of data and, and if they have issues, notification and, and restitution on those things. In projects and when we execute things, we also now have in our project charter template, um, all of the privacy elements and a requirement that if you um, use uh, PII information, personally identifiable information, then you have to describe how those um, seven elements are being properly addressed for the project to be approved. And we have the digital privacy officer that was approved um, as part of the current fiscal year budget. That um, process is going right now. We have um, the interview panel with our privacy advisory task force um, this Friday. And so hopefully by the end of September, uh, we'll have a digital privacy officer on board. Um, if we don't find the perfect candidate, of course, we can always go out back out, but um, we're hopeful that um, this round will identify someone who can fill this very novel role. So uh, a reminder is what the Cyber Law Clinic um, has said is that no one's doing privacy well. Uh, we have a couple um, communities that are ahead of the curve that they've tried early and done some good work, but privacy continues to evolve. It's limited by some of the, the traditional processes um, and operations that folks have, limited by some of the technologies. And we have more examples of where communities have gone too fast because they wanted to do something novel and innovative where privacy wasn't really considered. And, and so some of the sensor networks on streetlights, uh, some of their surveillance technologies and how that data is used, there's, there's a lot of stories out there about how that information can be used incorrectly. And one of the ethics that we have here is for some of those uses of information, you can't walk back from once you've done that. The information is out there or the use is out there, the trust is compromised. So we're gonna be very mindful setters of the privacy products and how can we create the tools, the conferences, the certifications to get to that community of practice going to a point where there's maturity faster than there otherwise would be. And then we're also doing a survey of where um, privacy is in local and state government. And with that, um, we can see where we need to invest next. Uh, and so that will be coming out in the next two to three months. And the advisory task force, uh, we're gonna conclude with um, a couple key points. The advisory task force that we assembled, formidable people, what they've given us feedback on, it's direct, it's honest, um, and, it's, and it's hard critiques is when you come to privacy, now matters more than ever because of all these um, data initiatives and technologies we're deploying and all the money that's going out there from the federal aid. This shouldn't be, let's get to it later, focus on it now because now is your chance and, and it might be too late if we don't do it now. The other points that they have is make sure that we're doing concrete actions, not just talking about privacy and the communities that we have and serve are deserving of action. And so they were um, pleased with our concrete actions also challenged us to keep on uh, focusing more on it and uh, including like that research library, the national work and so forth. Um, but the task force um, also was very clear that they will refuse to be window dressing. So they're gonna keep on challenging us and making sure that we are true to our intent and word on why privacy, digital privacy matter. And, and we welcome that, that feedback and that push. So last items is just wanna say our roadmap ahead for 2021 is that foundational layer of digital privacy. In 2022, we're gonna to get to a level of practice. And then 2023 is really where we're gonna be mature about this. And we are going to develop that community of practice and that national coalition so that communities are served well by digital privacy. And then the last thing we'll say is that the reason why it matters, and we always have to write our compass, is that um, privacy is actually about the trust of our community. The services that we render, um, that, that's, that's our brand and, and how well we do that or how much trust we have. But it's very easy if we misuse that information for that trust to ebb very quickly. So in all of our activities, we're trying to remind ourselves that we protect this information because it's protecting the people on the other end of our services who matter so much to us. And with that, we can take any questions, comments, and the feedback that you have. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate the perspective you and your team are bringing on, on this 
issue that's so critical for us to get right. And, and the fact that you're positioning the city of San Jose to be a leader on digital privacy as, as we should be and looking to be collaborative with other cities. And I, I just really appreciate the report. Um, with, with that, we'll come back to the committee in a moment. Why don't we hear public comment on our final item and we will start with Mr. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. The survival of democracy depends on the ability of large numbers of people to make realistic choices in the light of adequate information. A dictatorship, on the other hand, maintains itself by censoring or distorting the facts and by appealing not to reason, not to enlightened self-interest, but to passion and to prejudice, end quote. That's Aldous Huxley. And he wrote that in 1932, Brave New World. And what I just heard from that gentleman, I fear that man more than I do a gang member that's tattooed all over his face. Because what he just stated and how he just stated it, there's a lot of assumptions in these policies. Number one, that the city is assuming that they somehow or another have a right to do that. Like, like, like have a right to go into people's minds, use data analytics, okay? And, and really see how can, we, how can we engineer human behavior? How can we like crush a human mind, crush a human spirit without even knowing that it's been, do, but that it's been done to them? Okay, because that's what data does. What, what, what you're doing is you're trying to accumulate so much information that no human being was designed to have. You're, you're not worthy of being, of, of people trusting you. N nobody is, I'm not, uh, Mayhem, you're not. Just because we elected you, you're gonna start making these decisions? Who elected you to do that? That wasn't part of your election. And neither was this guy. Th these people that are on this committee today are very, very, I mean, extremely dangerous. I mean, very dangerous. Unless you have the ACLU on these policies and checking it every single step of the way. I mean, sitting right next to this dude when he's talking, then the whole, it's nothing but a sham. What you're doing is Google is getting this infrastructure. The city belongs to them now. I can see it. I see it. Thank you. Uh, we're on to Blair. Hi, uh, thank you for the words of Paul. Um, his first words were very interesting. I mean, the whole point of uh, the surveillance technology ordinance issues, uh, I don't talk about it enough, but it is really to make a more equal balance between the role of government and everyday community. It is to really level the playing field. And you guys, it's difficult. You don't want to do that, but you're making your steps. Uh, Rob Lloyd is talking about privacy policies in terms of community. He was not doing that a year ago. So thank you very much, Rob. Um, you know, you have this. You have this task force committee meeting coming up this Friday. It was not on any calendar. Thank you for sharing the information. But why, why wasn't it on the city calendar? Why? Because you have a policy and a set of practices that is uh, that, that amounts to uh, dictate instead of, you know, there's a real important future about what this uh, ordinance, uh, ACLU ordinance ideas can, can, can share and, and create a process of cooperation that we're just on the surface of addressing of what is possible for our future. We're taking our first steps, it's a little tough, but I think it can, you know, this, this guideline process, we're gonna have a more open democratic future uh, where community is involved and can be allowed to be involved. Imagine that concept. So this is the stuff we're underway with. Uh, you're talking about uh, Vision Zero issues earlier. Um, a really nice guy, he wants to base it on the, the ideas of, of what can be good data. And you know we have some new data going around with Vision Zero based on equity. Let's you know, do that well and not turn this into a, a funding frenzy uh, and, and really bad data continuously flowing. Let's get our even out uh, how to work out the issues of equity with the Vision Zero stat on KSI. Let's do it well, thanks. Thank you. Molly? Thank you. Molly, we seem to have lost you. You wanna try again? 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. The privacy statement is extremely important when I can think about it through a disability equity lens. Um, some of the most uh, private information is on health status and um, also economic status. Um, and a lot of things that, that um, you need to qualify for certain types of um, services and more and more the, um, there are connections and information sharing. So the, the thought that has and needs to go into this is really important. I also noted the three cities that were called out as being um, more advanced in this, uh, Seattle, New York, and Chicago, and note that all three of them have um, focuses on disability equity. Um, as well as racial equity. And the city of San Jose is really still at the very basic level on all of on the, the accessibility part. When you're gathering the um, uh, community impact, community statement and engagement part, um, mm -hmm. being able to do that in a way that um, involves um, capacity for video blogs um, and ASL interpreters for captioning, for um, the multimodal ways of being able to participate. But then it also goes to the tools that you've been purchased. Um, so an accessible procurement process policy. I think this comment goes better actually on the, the SJ311, but I was looking at the Oracle Cloud Services Accessibility Guide and it, it, it took me just a second to look up, but it lists a bunch of things that it, um, that are not included in the workarounds depend on staff. That means the city staff have to know about basic accessibility. And um, to be a real leader, we need to know much more than just that foundational information as well. So that's my accessibility plug for the week. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. And Tessa. Thank you. Um, well, what Paul had mentioned to me when his concerns was in regards to digital privacy is that there could be a lot of um, uh, controlling and, and um, like stopping a public participation by those whose views are considered um, uh, too uh, radical. So that I, I, I don't really understand how the digital privacy issues could, could do that, but that's, you know, the concern, I guess. And, and so... Um, but in terms of, you know, opening up our digital uh, policies, I think that's very important in regards to what I was talking about in regards to uh, how we need to expose our, our fossil fuel use and that, that we need to see how we can really make that a public very accessible. And then when we have accountability, when we, like even the city has you know claimed a, a climate emergency and they i think original the original plan was for us to have it be at the 1990 levels uh, of the uh, so can paris we get back agreement on, topic, please? on pri privacy well anyway I, that's what i'm i'm saying is that we need to open up the digital policy to be very open to uh, us be able to access the data and you know that that's what you know we need to increase the openness of our digital policy um, in regards to um, this issue of digital privacy. But anyway, I just, you know, just am saying that, you know, data needs to be re readily available and accountable in terms of how we're going about our, our community, you know, efforts and our tax dollars, how they're being used. And so that, that's all I'm saying is that we need to make uh, public our digital, whatever digital information we're having and specifically about our fossil fuel use, I'm saying. And so that's, that's just it. Okay, thank you. Back to the panel. And just as I come back to uh, my colleagues, Rob, could you just give us a quick overview of the task force and who, who's, um, who's represented on it? And I, I, I heard mention of the ACLU, I believe we may be working with, is that right? Yeah, the ACLU um, of Northern California does have a member, Victor um, Sin. This group is the, the privacy, Digital Privacy Advisory Task Force, and those members are there to challenge us and make sure that we're attending to the, the uses in, in the proper ways. We also have um, Roxana from the Silicon Valley um, NAACP, uh, Bob Lim from SJSU, Arena Raiku Markula Center for um, Ethics, Applied Ethics at S um, Santa Clara University, Mike Shapiro, who's the digital privacy officer or chief privacy officer for Santa Clara County, 
And then Stephen Keynes, uh, when he joined us, was with the Sanford Law School's Center for Legal Informatics. So really tried to, to get the partners who could challenge us in the right ways. Yeah, really a diverse and all-star group of folks. And I'm so glad you were able to assemble that group to hold us accountable. Councilor Foley. Whoops. Believe me. There we go. End, end of a long day. Uh, first of all, I'll just start by moving acceptance of the report. Do we have a second? And I think I'm allowed to second. Go ahead. Oh, wait a minute. Did we lose council member Cohen? Uh, no, he's here. He was just transitioning to the car. Okay. I'm in here. I had to unmute myself. Um, I'll second it. Okay, thanks. Uh, just just quickly, um, thank you for the report about privacy. This Your report really is about protecting the privacy of the data that we're collecting and not allowing uh, Google and anyone else to have access to that data. This is really protecting personal information that is provided to us for a lot of different reasons, whether it's building permits or whatever, that we are collecting at the city and how we are going to protect it from um, ha being hacked or stolen or accessed by uh, uh, illegal or uh, unacceptable terms. So that I just wanted to clarify that because several of the callers commented that we were going to give free access to information, but that's not it. This is about protecting the privacy of individuals who give us that information, believing that we are protecting it. So we need to take every step possible to make sure that it is, that information is not at, at risk. And it could be things like, well, it's personal inf identification information. So social security numbers, addresses, birth dates, things like that, that we need to really make sure that we are protecting. Like many industries, we uh, are already required to protect that information. Um, so I just wanted to leave it with that and uh, and uh, return back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you just reinforcing that really important clarification. Great. And Councilor Cohen? Uh, yeah, thank you, Councilor Rafael. You made the point I was about to make, but I'll just piggyback on this onto the last item, just simply the San Jose 311 app, people are readily providing us with personal contact information that we collect and store. And so this is just the policy that we have to have that protects that information and, and is the technology that we use to make sure that the information people readily and voluntarily give us is protected. So any idea that this is some kind of surveillance or anything more than that, uh, is not true. I mean, that this is just us as an IT department making sure that we're protecting information that people give us because as necessity, people have to give the city, whether it's because they, they're getting their utilities or other things through us, or they're asking for rental assistance, or they're asking us for other services they have to provide. So um, I'm uh, thankful that we have a great IT department, Rob, that you're leading to uh, help us make sure that we're um, on the vanguard of of privacy, this is a very tough thing to do, and we are always um, at risk um, for the security. But um, I'm hopeful that that we will continue to protect all of our residents from um, the, uh, from the danger of having their information fall into the wrong hands. So thank you. Thanks, Council Member and Rob. Did you want to offer a few thoughts? Yeah, just one, one extra definition. So the security is, is core to us, uh, but that's a security layer. The responsible use of that information and in, in all of our work is the privacy piece. So it's yeah, actually- Yeah, good point. I, I sort of conflated the two. I didn't really quite mean that, but yes, that's the, how we, how we use it, is it, how we use the data and we don't use it inappropriately, I guess should have said. <laughs> right, cool, thank you. There we go. All right, sounds like we're all on the same page. I believe we are ready for a roll call vote. Foley? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mann? Aye. All right. Thank you. I appreciate everybody hanging in there for three really substantive and important items today. We're going to go back to the public for open forum prior to adjourning. And we will start with Paul. He got you, Cohen. He got you. He checked you. We, we see what you're doing, man. We see exactly what you're doing. And I'm quoting, 
Let us beware of defining mental hygiene as the prevention of symptoms. Symptoms as such are not our enemy, but our friend. Where there are symptoms, there is conflict, and conflict always indicates that the forces of life which strive for integration and happiness are still fighting. The really hopeless victims of mental illness are to be found among those who appear to be most normal. Many of them are normal because they are so well adjusted to our mode of existence, because their human voice has been silent so early on in their lives that they do not even struggle or suffer or develop any symptoms of, that the neurotic does. They are, they are normal not in what may be called the absolute sense of the word. They are normal only in relation to an abnormal society as their perfect adjustment to that abnormal society is a measure of their mental sickness. These millions of abnormally normal people living without fuss in a society in which if they were fully human, they ought not to be adjusted, still cherish the illusion of individuality, their conformity in developing into something like uniformity, but uniformity and freedom are incompatible. Uniformity and mental health are incompatible too. Man is not made to be an automaton, but if he becomes one, the basis of mental health is destroyed." End quote. That is from uh, Eric Fromm, psychoanalysis straight out the pages of, of Brave New World. I'm telling you, man, this is where we're at. Brave New World, read it. Then put that together with some analysis and you know, get your, get your data analysis and your analytics. Uh, is it, apply it to the principles in 1984 and see what you come up with. Thank you. Tessa. Well, oh, well, one thing I wanted to comment is that I find it offensive that the, the data that um, our council members get on us, like they get our emails, and then they go ahead and start advertising about their company and or their sales of their real estate. And so, you know, and I made that comment to them. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, digital privacy, I think that, you know, we are giving our emails um, to, to the council members to be part of our democracy. And we don't want it used for their personal gain. So that, I think that's really an important uh, distinction about um, in relationship to privacy, that that it is, should not be misused. And everybody's been saying that. And I think that I see it being misused in that way. And the other thing I find offensive is um, that my council members are um, – advertising to me to go to the restaurants and and things like that and it's it's in the it's in the guise of you know economic development but i i find that you know when we're in so many crises that are the roles of our our government and their access to our information are you know to be able to reach out to us it, it needs to be about the crises that we're we're facing and not about you know that we're you know going to go spend more money at restaurants and and things like that, that are part of the problem, and that we need to be really addressing how to get resilient communities. That is your role, is to protect us from harm. And for you to be saying to us to go to the, to the you know, go shopping, like even Mayor Licardo said, you know, and we're telling everybody, go shopping. And, and you know, and that, that's wrong. That, that is leading us down the path of harm. And so, and, you know, so it's, it's really about protecting us from harm and the way building resiliency. Is, is your goal, is your role to protect us from harm. Thank you, Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, the future of cybersecurity is about both open public policy and uh, privacy policy. I'm sorry you, if you felt my words were a bit out of balance. Uh, it is my feeling that we may, we may need to take some new steps to better clarify the science around the many vaccines currently available. It should include how to make clear the good intentions around aerosol vaccines. The previous system of COVID-19 checks to allow city employees the choice of either taking the vaccine or taking a weekly COVID test seems a well-reasoned, smart, decent way to work, as we simply do not know how to be more honest with ourselves and our media about the vaccine process. 
I hope we can offer the same creative good thinking for the future of the passport vaccine process, as well as honesty, honesty and directness can be the better choices of our good democracy and how to offer more open, good-minded decision-making for ourselves and society. And to offer uh, how we can all participate in the process to help out with the future issues of people moving out of the Columbus Park area, and to once again try to paraphrase Scott Largent from the past few weeks, the city of San Jose should be reviewing and trying to soften their current tow truck policies for the Columbus Park area. A reminder once again, the city of Palo Alto and their community have developed some very good humanistic practices regarding people sleeping in their cars in local neighborhood streets and parking lots. This can be of much help with the Columbus Park area at this time. And to quickly offer, uh, you know, just a good luck to uh, Gavin Newsom. I mean, he's been through a lot, as we as we all have uh, this this past few years. Uh, I think a vote for him uh, this upcoming September uh, would be important. It would in, invite a certain continuity and that we could all prepare for the general election in 2022 for governor, I think it would be a more regular feeling and process. And it, I think it would be a more interesting time for all of us if we were to vote for Governor Newsom uh, this September. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great evening.